Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warship Guitar Show, episode number 48. Harnessing the creative energies to move forward in whatever it is that you're doing is super, super important. So the concept of capturing creativity is about not only just kind of knowing where to find it, knowing what to do with it, knowing how to revisit it, but also then in turn knowing how to kind of dole it out on a regular basis such that you're not just kind of going through the motions of whatever it is that you're doing with an instrument in your hands or as you're preparing for a Sunday service or whatever. There are a couple of things that motivated me to pick this topic tonight. Uh, first of all, my dear friend, uh, let's see if I can pronounce his name right the first time out of the gate. Jem uh, Magtibe, and I understand that... Uh, if you pronounce it in the, the kind of the Filipino, or I guess with a Tagalog type of thing, be Mugtabay, or something like that. But in any case, uh, he's doing a video on kind of helping worship guitar players kind of figure out how to be more creative in um, in the act of what they do. And that video is actually going to drop tomorrow. And you can get over to Jem's YouTube by visiting this link right here. Uh, so it's youtube.com slash user slash gemwell97 or just search gemwell and you'll find him. Um, but the thing is, is that he's doing this video that really kind of got me inspired just thinking about this whole process of creativity. One of the other things, uh, hello, Alan. Uh, perfect example. Some of the folks that I'm seeing here, I'm also seeing pop up, uh, thankfully so, on my mainstream, quote unquote, live stream on Saturdays. And really it occurred to me that as much as we may play at church or we may play at some stanky bar with sawdust on the floor, our journey is, is very similar. So I really wanted to speak specifically to quote unquote you guys about how we bring in creativity into our process because um, one of the challenges of playing at church is that in many ways it's kind of like a turnstile. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out there are generally very few opportunities to linger in the creative zone, for better, worse, or in between. And by that, I mean your average mainstream band does, when we're kind of back in the cycle of this, you know, two or three nights a week rehearsal, they hang out for two or three hours, you know, they have this intense bonding time, they have this time where they properly rehearse, I'm just gonna say it, and they have a chance to really bask in this creative thing where they'll actually say, hey, hang on a second. You know, let's take that section. Let's open it up. Let's, oh, yeah, hit that groove there. Yeah, yeah, that was great, you know. And they hang out in this space. And they kind of, if you will, if it's, if it's a bath of creativity, as awkward as it sounds, they all kind of hop in with their instruments and clothes on, I will add. But they're just kind of in the vibe together, right? And as much as we don't have that kind of jumping into the musical hot tub, you know, shoulder to shoulder, we do have the opportunity to bring that in to our preparation time, our practice time, and bring that onto the platform. So what I really wanted to speak to was some specific ways that we can do that and some specific ideas. The other person that really inspired me going into this uh, was Larry Mitchell. Uh, so I did a recording video Zoom thing yesterday that Larry was on. And Larry totally schooled me in a really loving way on a couple of things. My kind of vibe on sound, uh, and he's kind of caught enough on my live streams that he, in the most loving way, really called me out without actually calling him out, but was calling me out. My thing is I like to use one or usually two guitars kind of panned either just off center or hard left and hard right, and then effects in stereo hard left and hard right. And one of the things that he he kind of unpacked is like, look, you know, and he said it, but he was like, you know, Ahem, let, let me make sure I've got your attention. Uh, you know, as you're, you know, creating a, a soundscape, the idea is to change those things up with a stereo field such that as you're taking somebody through a journey from the beginning of a song to the end, you're choosing sometimes it's dual mono where it's really the same thing left and right. So you're not always in this giant spacious thing. And I was like... Oh, that's so painfully obvious, I completely missed it. Um, so the goal of tonight 
is in many ways finding the painfully obvious that, I, that so I actually missed it things that maybe are right in front of you and or just giving you some some fuel for thought because again because I'm seeing so many of you show up on my Saturday morning mainstream uh, which I really appreciate uh, it also means that the the time together is obviously permeating more of your life so I want to make sure I do a better job of stewarding that so with that said uh, one of the things that's really important that I'm always doing and I'm really conscious of doing is resourcing myself. It's not an accident that I continue to grow as a musician. It's a purposeful choice, but I'm also very mindful of resourcing myself. What does that look like specifically? Uh, I am mindful of the fact that I am always being inspired by players like Jam, uh, who is this young kid, comparatively, uh, early 20s, uh, and yet he's this well of creativity and already has that inspirational spirit for pe the things that he's bringing to people. So he's already leading at a church. Uh, this, this The young adults uh, just stepped into this role, a for hire gig, which is actually really cool. He's going to learn so much in the process of that. But he's already just kind of going, oh, what are the things that are really giving people a hard time? And again, the heart of this subject tonight was really inspired by what he was talking about doing with this video to inspire creativity with guitar players around parts and all those things. So that'll drop tomorrow. So the idea here is how do we actually resource ourselves? So for me, I'm always watching TV as I'm just getting ready to go to sleep. That's just kind of how I get into my zone. But my phone, wherever the heck that little sucker is, here we go, is always by my side. And we're gonna talk about this. Well, I, we're kind of jumping over here a little bit right now. But in terms of harnessing technology, this guy and um, uh, and notes and also, gosh darn it, what the heck, my old age, what do you call, gosh darn it, <laughs> right, um, you, voice memos, of course, silly me, voice memos, every so often I'll change computers and it's like, Doug Doppler's 10,000 voice memos, I'm like, holy cow, I'm always recording stuff, I'm always, if I'm out and about, uh, I'm going to Shazam stuff. So if you take a look, although, you know, it's not easy to see, you're going to see literally kind of in the first and second rows on my phone here, in addition to, uh, you know, basically all my favorite apps for, you know, whether it's email or microphones for this thing or the Fender app or you know, the YouTube app and, and iTunes, they're all about creativity. So pretty much I open up my phone and all I think about is things that, are creative to me. And it also makes it really easy to get over to voice memos and just record something if I hear it. Or if I'm out and about and I hear something that I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I'm immediately gonna Shazam it. And then I send that over to Apple Music. So it means that I've automatically got a record of all these things that have been there. So in the process of harnessing technology, that's one of the things. So let's move back to actually this concept of resourcing yourself. So technology is one of the things that I'm always using as a vehicle, but you know, there are different ways that we can resource ourselves. One, for example, a really like easy way to do it is, is like quite often when churches are in rotation, you know, you kind of do your rehearsal, pre-service, whatever. Once again, churches are back up and running with this whole COVID shot thing, that's gonna happen sooner than later. We usually don't watch somebody else's rehearsal, right? But just as an easy, very low, bar for admission. What if we just actually went on a week that we weren't rostered and you just kind of watch what the other guitar players do. Kind of watch how they load in. Kind of watch how prepared they are. Watch how they engage the other musicians. Watch what they bring in terms of creativity to the atmosphere. And so this is the thing, this is the heart of all of this really, if I can capsulize it and go out from there again, we live in this kind of static thing where quite often the way we do worship at church is a little dry. We kind of all get up, we do our parts, and then we leave, right? That's the antithesis of the way mainstream music is done. Um, so again, our ability to just kind of show up and just have this wellspring of creativity that preceded our showing up and is there present when we do it is a great way to kind of go, okay, I'm surrounding myself, I'm cloaking myself in creativity. So regardless of what th this kind of quick in and out moment that happens with the worship team. We're there for a quick rehearse, excuse me, uh, a run through. It's not even a rehearsal. Uh, and then and then we do the service and then we're done. So the idea 
is to really, really be thoroughly prepared in all the different ways you can, creatively speaking. So the idea of watching what somebody else does, you know, as they're getting ready to go into the service would be a great way to kind of go, that's really interesting. You know, you kind of watch how they engage these different things. And for me, I had a really revelatory moment. I'm working on a video for a company called DPA. They make ridiculously amazing mics. And the guy that I'm working with, Paul Andrews, who works for DPA, talked about this thing, this concept of creative mixing versus corrective mixing. And it just was like a light switch went on. I was like, wow, because consciously, I then got into a place where I'm like, how much of what I do around making music or working for the magazine or doing live streams is kind of done with the work light switch on versus the creative light switch on. And I pretty much made the decision at that point that anything that I can do that has anything to do with creativity, the work light switch stays off and the creativity light switch stays on. So again, that inspiration from creative mixing versus corrective mixing, I don't want to live out without live being that corrective mixer. And without going down that rabbit trail, I'll just say there's very clear differences between the two. One, you're fixing flat tires. The other is you're adding glorious reverb to breakdowns and all this stuff where it goes from cool to amazing. We want to live in the zone where it goes from cool to amazing. And I'm seeing all the great comments in there, so I want to see them, but I need to pay attention to making sure I stay focused here. So with all that said, resourcing yourself, make a list of five ways that you can resource yourself. YouTube videos are a constant place that I go. Uh, I am always, again, I'm using technology, whether it's Shazam, voice memos. Um, you know, the other thing is, is that one of the other ways you can resource yourself, again, this gets back to harnessing technology, is with gear. The interesting, the reason I grab this guitar, every time I look at this guitar, it makes me think about being creative. It pulls me into a space where I just want to sit down and play this guitar and be in some really cool creative space literally just by looking at it. So doing things that we can purposefully do to pull ourselves into that creative space and hang out there as much as is possible is key. All right, let me then, let's talk about scrapbooking inspiration. So this is one of the other really important things that I do. I'm very, very conscious of on my computer, uh, on Facebook, on voice memos, I have places where I store photos that have particular inspiration. I'm, I, I'm, let's see, the, when I kind of got really active as a member of the Worship Musician team, I kind of started collecting all sorts of different types of inspiration for the total makeover that we did on the magazine, uh, graphic design wise. And so I basically designed all the different layouts for the cover, for the internal pages, for reviews. I put together a style guide. And, and Bruce Adolph, who I can see is on the chat here, much love, brother, gave me the freedom to do it. Um, and so in the framework of that, I was able to just kind of go, let's do this. It was done as a team. I didn't do anything on my own. I was able to take my ideas to Bruce. And part of this came from something, the last record that I made, I worked with a guy by the name of Brian Fessenden. And he is, at least the last time I checked, was the manager of the Gap Photo Studio. Uh, and made rather a large amount of money as a top-notch professional photographer. And those of you that know anything about photography know that it's really hard to get hired as a photographer, much less become a go-to professional, which is what he's done his entire life. So he said, I want you, when you come into this photo shoot, because we did the photos for the album, I want you to come in with a, t a bunch of your favorite photos of different types of things, whether it's the color, the light, the style, the look. I want you to put that together. I think we had a pre-production meeting. So he knew what I was going for and he just nailed it. It also meant that I went into that photo shoot with a very clear idea of what I wanted to have coming out and we just nailed it. So the idea of this scrapbooking things, like on Facebook, you can save videos, you can save them in different categories. So I've got marketing categories, I've got musical inspiration categories, I've got young guns, players like Jim that I just need to watch who's coming up from behind me, you know, just kind of going, okay, there they, there they go. Because I wanna be able to watch their trajectory because guess what? I learn stuff from the people that are younger than I am in terms of how they engage technology. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing about that, and one of the other things we talk about here, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, is celebrating your victories. 
So this is one of the things that's really, really important is that, you know, in the process of what I've been doing personally, my journey, and I want to share it because I can only share my perspective with you. I can't, you know, speak for others, but I've kind of watched Jet just, Jem just fly by me and kind of went, okay, I need to spend some time playing catch up with kind of what reality is. So I've spent basically two years building two video studios, spending amount of, a huge amount of time studying videography again, graphic design, and, you know, although our worship musician, social media, you're, you're about to see a huge uptake, uptick rather, really making sure that, that, that we're understanding what people like Jim just do naturally. So the idea is, is, as I've kind of been kind of not feeling completely left behind, as I'm celebrating that victory, it's like, I'm learning some stuff. And that's a really important thing to do, especially for those of you who, like myself, are a little bit older. It's really easy to kind of begin to go, wow, this world is kind of, in some ways, leaving me behind. How much of that am I cool with? And how much of that am I not cool with? And how much of that can I change? And of the things that I can change, what am I doing about this? So this, again, is where the scrapbooking of inspiration comes down because it really allows me to come back to um, a, a huge range of things. The other thing is I'm looking above my desk. I've got a stack that wide of different magazines and books that I'm constantly looking for, for visual inspiration from. Again, the same thing with videos, same thing, obviously, with YouTube. It literally got to the point where I created a a spreadsheet in Google Sheets where I had specific types of videos. I think I had them separated by tabs and then specific comments about those videos such that I could navigate that stuff when I'm looking for, it's kind of, if you will, a content inspiration library. So I could go the Dewey Decimal System, if you will, the Dougie Decimal System, and I could find the type of content that I was looking for when I needed to come back to that moment that inspired me. And this is why it's so important. Those moments happen for all of us. Most people, dare I say, don't have an active strategy for harnessing that. And the ability of coming back and revisiting that inspiration is hugely important to being able to continue to own that. So every time I go back to those, uh, you know, film music. So uh, there's a company, I, is it Soundbed? It's a company that basically creates sound beds for film. Music bed, that's what they're called. So they did one issue. It was kind of, I think, probably a flop for them. It was a print magazine called Film, film Dash Music. And it was brilliantly done, and I ordered it. And every time I go in there, there's a certain unique connection between the visual and the musical that I'm pulled back to that place in time where I first saw that marketed and the inspiration that came from that. I'm able to revisit that, and it's in a specific place that I can access it when I need to. Um, so that scrapbooking process is hugely important. Uh, I do the same thing. I've got folders I'm looking at them where I've actually, at a certain point, I just had to thin the herd. So I've literally gone in with like an X-Acto knife and taken specific pages out of these different magazines and now put them together in just some sort of a folder so I can go through and grab that stuff. The same thing is true of musical things. Again, I'm using that as an example, but we want to be able to do that so we can scrapbook that stuff. Um, this is, I started to put... Uh, Zoom by this a moment ago. I also wanted to speak to this because in a moment I'm going to get down and actually um, interact with you. And I apologize. I'm kind of talking at you. It's one of the things I hate doing in live streams. But it's also I get distracted when I get down into the chat. And I don't want to do that either. Um, I want to chat but not get distracted. So here's the thing. I learn more about debriefing people on the creative process the more I pour into others. And, and ironically... You know, I got a text from one of the people that I work with professionally uh, in, um, in, an, in, in uh, a, a, I can say this, around the guitar camps. And they, and they were just kind of like, hey, you know, um, you know, I mentioned I've got this new video. I actually, by the way, I'm a little self-promotion. I literally, at 4 o'clock Pacific, I dropped a new video on uh, YouTube.com slash Doug Doppler on the quad cortex. So if you get a moment, please go check that out. And if you will share it on, you know, on your Facebook, if you'd be so kind, or at least just leave a comment and go, Doug, you're terrible. And you're a shameless promoter, self-promoter. But the thing is, is that that video, one of the things I did was organize these chapters so you can get to each section in there. And I'm having this text exchange from, from a guy that I work with at the guitar camps. 
and I and you know I said hey I just dropped this new video he said what are you up to and this is this and I'm really you know and I said hey by the way because they are also working in the live streaming and video spaces by the way the my big takeaways and things that you might want to just pilfer from me in particular with the chapter markers so you can you know put the timeline links it makes it so it's super organized and he was like dude how do you do that and so I'm sending him the link to the YouTube video that I studied, but then I'm also giving him the tips of things that I did in my process. And I kind of went, ooh, there's a video that I'm going to make there. And that had I not been pouring into him, I wouldn't have realized probably a hundred people I know are making YouTube videos. And they would love to know how to do that and also know the tips on how to do that and some thoughts about how as you're creating your content, you can set that up. And I'm like, Note to self. So the idea of pouring into others, and again, you've heard me blab on, um, and hopefully humbly so. Somebody used the word humble brag with me at one point. Oh, look at that, Jim's text is over there. Go away. Love you, Jim. Hang on, I gotta unlock this. There we go. Boom. Okay. Um, but the idea of pouring into others, there was a drummer uh, that got added to my old worship team that never should have been on there. Uh, at least before he could actually play to a click, uh, seeing as everything we were doing was done to a click. But I just spent, you know, Saturday mornings with him for a couple of months. Uh, and guess what? You know what? I got way more out of it than he did. And by the time we were done, he could play with the click. And there was a bond that we had in the process of that. And I learned a lot about that. I've shared repeatedly. This is how you do it. You just kind of start off just getting him hit kick and snare with the click. Kick and snare. Kick, snare. Kick, kick, snare. One, two, three, and four. And if they can't even do that, just have them hit quarters on the hi-hat and get comfortable. And if they can't even do that, just have them listen to the click. Now just hit the downbeat of each method. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Then two and four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Kick, two, three, four. Kick, two, three, four. Kick, two, kick, four. One, that is a kick on one. Kick on three. Kick, 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 as in one, two, three, and four, and kick, 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 hi-hat, kick, hi-hat. So all of a sudden, you're just getting him to learn how to play drums, but with the click. And it's like, you know, honestly, we should do a video on that. Bruce, I can see you're over there. We should be doing a video on that uh, on the Worship Musician channel. So the point being is, is that, you know, it's, it's just a process, but what I learned, and more importantly, what I got out of it, was just invaluable. Okay, um... Those are the main big points that I really wanted to make sure that we got to. Uh, so now that that's happened, I would love to kind of take a look and, first of all, say hello to everybody. Rick, hello to you, my fellow maestrous friend. Uh, Forrest, great to see you. Thanks so much. Uh, Friedman, thank you. Much appreciated. Cool. And actually, this guitar is a... So this is the... Um, this is, as I understand, and Bruce will be able to correct me on this, so the guitar that Jimi Hendrix burned at Monterey Pop um, was either the Black Strat or a guitar that uh, looked like this before he started burning it. And I, you have to excuse my Monterey Pop recollection, uh, but on Wild Thing, which I think is the burning guitar thing, I think it was playing the black guitar, and I think that's the guitar that Dweezil Zappa has. I'll have to double check on that. Oh, awesome. From the Philippines. Great. Oh, super cool. So how did I do with the pronunciation on Jeb's name? Probably terrible. Okay. Um, so, all right. Oh, I've got lots of neural DSP stuff already. I love it. Um, so, uh, you know, here, so here's the thing is, is that uh, noting that we already opened the door on the technology side, I'm, I'm in Facebook and I'm going to move over to YouTube. Um, you know, again, the idea of when I, when I, and Steve, I talked about this. He said, you know, he was, when he was a kid, he used to just sit and stare at his guitar. Just, you just kind of look at it, just kind of like, oh, oh, isn't that cool? You know, and I, and I, you know, it's, it's almost, it, what comes to mind is the, the words, although somebody will, what's going on with Fishman Guitar? Somebody, uh, I can see a little pre-chat uh, thing come through here on the interface. Um, you know, it's a kind of almost like a, a childlike, wondrous faith about the guitar, right? Where there's the, and, and if we're, we're, we're not careful, we can lose that. But I, I still have that amazement. I remember Lincoln Brewster saying once, uh, he said, I've fallen back and I've fallen all over once again, back in love with the guitar. And it was just kind of him kind of going, right, I've forgotten just in, in a way, or if I can make the analogy without crossing some line, our inner musician 
that first love of the guitar, if that was your first instrument. If not, then whatever it, it would be. But for me, when I was five, I remember seeing my neighbor, he had this little toy guitar with like literally the string strings, the red and white string. But I saw that and was like, so I basically pestered that kid until he let me take that guitar home for a night. Like I was relentless. And so the guitar borrowing started at age five and here I am. Uh, but I was just smitten and totally fixated. It was like, I must play this thing. I can't even tell you, you know, like, you know, it's very strange for a kid. It's like, you know, your average kid at that age is like, I want a football. But I was like, I want that guitar and I'm going to pester you until you give it to me. In any case, so the idea of the gear, you know, there are a couple of, of, of parts of this. So I want to be judicious in how I present this. One, uh, first of all, thank you for all the great feedback. One, we have to watch out for what I call Strymon Lust where like, oh, they've got a Strymon, my boss or my, you know, uh, MXR is not as cool as the Strymon they've got, right? We want to be conscious of not coveting. Uh, and I totally, totally feel on a very deep level how easy that is because I've done it. Um, that said, the positive side of it is, is the gear can help us enter into a zone. And the Strymon reverbs, they sound amazing. You know, this guitar, uh, you know, it, it. I already have a feeling emotionally before I pick it up and start playing. So it draws something out of you. So in terms of the quad cortex, um, you know, I am, and, uh, and I want to frame this conversation uh, intelligently. Uh, and to tell you the truth, tonight's show was initially going to be on this. <laughs> HX Stomp XL. And I am, ex I am as excited about this as I am quad cortex. Uh, I am, you know, I have worked with the Line 6 folks for a decade or so. They've been phenomenal to me. Uh, so there is going to be like, well, which one's better? Which is this? Which is that? Uh, and there's going to be people who can go like, I can't afford a $1,600 multi-effects. Am I going to now feel bad because I can afford an HX stomp? That's not who we are as believers, right? We're like, hey, we want you to have the most amazing experience possible, regardless of whether you're playing out of a tin can. So I want to be very mindful of how I unpack this stuff. That said, sometimes a new piece of gear is this gateway that opens creativity. So for those of you that are going to hang out with the quad cortex, it's an amazing piece of gear. Amazing. Um, the ability to capture other amps and pedals. It does not currently have the ability to capture time-based effects. The effects are probably, the effects are, are really good, but honestly, I think there are better effects than other units right now. That said, the digital delay is great. The mod reverb, great. Modulated reverb. So those are going to be the places I would suggest starting. Amps sound great, and it's going to continue to get better. Um, so I do not think that they sound superior. And I think the, this, it's going to be probably the one thing you'll hear repeatedly from, from people is like, you know, uh, the, you know whether it's, it's Axe Effects, whether it's Helix, uh, I think it's the one area where people are going to be going, we want to, we want more. And there'll be more because those guys, D Doug Castro, the, the guy that founded that, who also founded Dark Glass, by the way, um, those guys are super, super smart. And the standalone plugins, the all the effects that are in those are just amazing. So they're just, you know, they've been a little busy in the middle of COVID. <laughs> so it's a great question. Uh, and it totally fits in there because... You know, the neat thing is, when as I sat with the quad cortex, I just played different things. And that's the whole point. I want to inspire myself. I want you to be inspired. That is the goal. All right. Got a little catching up to do over here on Facebook. And I can actually bring it in over here. So let's do this. And again, uh, I can't uh, because of the type of feed that we use to connect to Facebook. And I don't have an option for that. I'm not able to bring any comments in directly and overlay them. So if I do bring in a comment and overlay that, and you wonder why I didn't do that if you're on Facebook, that's why. Do I need to unlock that scene? Yes, I do. Okay, here we go. All right, first of all, uh, Wall of Doug, great brand, I like that. Thank you, Alan. Um, and you know, here, here's the thing, Alan, honestly, you're one of the guys that really in addition to Jim and Larry, really got me thinking because you're kind enough. I've seen you showing up on Saturday mornings. I'm like, either this guy is really incredibly bored or he's hungry. And so then I'm like, well, what can I do that that I think can be the greatest service for you? Which is like, well, let's let's see if we can't 
he's obviously looking for something. So if I'm going to discern what that looking is, it's more. But that more actually is ultimately tethered to when you pick up the instrument, I want you to kind of go, there's something more there today than there was yesterday. And for me, the way I constantly rekindle that fire, not internally, but externally is by going, what is there that I can grab a hold of and make it my own? Uh, I'm going to take that opportunity to go back to this whole worship team scenario. Uh, there was somebody that came on here a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, you're not talking about worship very much. And I was like, well, it is called the worship guitar show. But, you know, the thing that I love about these sometimes snarky comments is they usually have some truth to them. And I try and be humble enough to listen to them and not let my ego get too much in the way or too overly bruised. Um, but it is bruising. And that's why people do that. It's, it's usually not done to be kind. And especially the reason it's disappointing, I usually don't call people out for it, is like as, as believers, we're, that's bad behavior. It's the sort of behavior that you wouldn't do if your pastor were on here, which means you shouldn't be doing it. Just saying. So back to the positive side of things. How do we outwork this as worship musicians? So this is where the prep, the prep time, it's one of the reasons I actually, I've never connected the dots, so thank you for this. Again, it's when you begin to kind of go, well, let me scratch away at some of the surface here. You know, you've heard me go off like I like to spend two or three hours before if there's a midweek rehearsal, you know, and the day of the midweek rehearsal, I've got the songs playing over and over. I'll spend at least two or three hours in serious prep time, usually more than that. Uh, and and then the Saturday night, I'll usually spend a couple more hours and or get up the Sunday morning before the crack of dawn and go over it because I'm ex I'm finding creative space to live inside that music. I'm hearing the music and I'm giving, this is super important, super important, so please hear this. Discard it if you want to, but I'm leaving myself time to become immersed in the creative process. The way we rehearse at church, it's honestly, it's kind of a ripoff. I'm just going to say it. That's opinion, but don't get a bad attitude because of me, but it's just kind of a ripoff. It just, it's just, it's just lame. I mean, and part of it is we, sometimes, you know, on a rented facility, that's all we can do. But, like, honestly, it's just, for those of us that have played in mainstream bands, it's just a joke. I'm just saying it. Done. Whew. Bye. Um, so, that said, being conscious of how we're going to infuse that the creative process into something where it's kind of this free stride thing, then we kind of go, well, that doesn't, that doesn't have to limit what I'm going to do in preparation how I'm going to express myself in that moment, and then how I'm going to learn from that moment. So that's why, you know, within reason, I'm, I'm listening to the parts. When the keys get changed, I know I'm going to have to transpose things. I'm generally not a capo player. So it gives me the opportunity to find voicings for the song that will support the, 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 vo the worship leader. And quite often, you know, when a song gets transposed by a third or a fourth, the part that was originally played, unless it's, you know, Salvation is Here is always my example. I don't care what key I'm going to do it in. I'm playing da 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 You know, if I have to move it up the neck, I add an octave or down below. Just by the way, if you find that there's a signature part you have to play and it thins out where you play it, just about everybody here has got some sort of device that you can add an octave down below and that'll fill it out. That's the go-to kind of like, can't go wrong. Preserve the part. I'm seeing other stuff come in. I will keep going back and forth. Um... So the idea is, is that that really enables us to stay true to the things that we need to on the arrangement. But then as we're listening to the, to the if, if it weren't a signature part, again, the salvation is here being a great example, an old one, but a great one. People are like, never heard of that. <laughs> if, you know, if that weren't a signature part, then sometimes you kind of go, well, maybe it just doesn't work in the transposed key, which is kind of the strategy. So like, well, if it's not working where it is in the neck, then just kind of maybe find something else. And I'm constantly looking for the part that's going to fit the song the way my team is going to play it and is going to support the worship leader. And so my, I know I've hit the mark when I'm playing something and the worship leader turns around and hears the, the care and consideration. This is the worship leader's vocal part. There's this little cloud of guitar that comes underneath and just supports them with the where I choose to place the voicings and any things like nines or elevens or thirteens or things that I do that add color on transitional chords before they come back to the resolution chord. 
And what it does is it sets the worship leader up for this amazing harmonic success rather than just kind of strumming through the chords. And there's nothing wrong. Look, if all you can do is strum through the chords, just do it. But the other thing is, is like, regardless of where you're at in your journey, listening to, for example, if all you do is play acoustic guitar and there's no shame in that, go listen to somebody like John Mayer play acoustic guitar. Uh, listen to Paul McCartney on Yesterday. Um, listen to um, um, Ed Sheeran. Listen to people that make James Taylor, who makes something out of the acoustic guitar and kind of go, what can I lift there? The other thing that, that most guitar players do as a purely practical thing is they have a tendency to just kind of go, I'm playing at the same dynamic level and I can't understand why my playing doesn't have more dynamics. Like, hit the strings with different volume and you're going to get there. It gets back to the Larry, uh, Larry Mitchell comment of like, you know, he's purposely creating peaks and valleys in the song by the presets that he's crafting and not everything this needs to be wide and deep. And I was like, Ooh. now I may or may not ultimately totally bend to that strategy, but I'm going to be paying attention to it. I'm going to be doing a lot more with that in mind. I'm going to be totally giving him a shout out every time I do, or maybe not every time, but, but frequently when I have the opportunity to do that, uh, because it's a really, it just, it was a, it, just in the same way, the, the way Paul Andrews from DPA was like, this whole thing about creative mixing versus cor corrective mixing, that was a transitional moment for me because I was like, I'm only living when humanly possible in the creative zone. And that means that I am, I, it means that the decisions that I make, the way that I do things, the way that I spend my energy, my joy level is done through, if I'm doing something creative, it's done through the creative lens. I don't let my creative stuff turn into work. But I was unaware that I'd been doing that. And I want to encourage you to kind of analyze how much of the stuff am I actually playing that could be creative in a non-creative way. I'm just going through the motions. So then again, getting back to like, well, what are some of the things, I, how can I add more dynamics? Am I actually really conscious of my dynamic levels at all? You'll hear me spout on about, you know, consciously actually writing on the chart on a level from one to 10, marking what you think you're going to play the dynamic sections at are going to be, and then if you need to change it up, change it up. But at least you're kind of going, I'm doing this. And, and the neat thing is, is that you you will begin to very be very conscious of the role that dynamics play in creativity. The other thing that will happen is when you play louder and softer, you're going to start to play different things. You're going to pick differently. You're going to use less notes in the chord or more notes in the chord or less delay or more delay. But you're going to change stuff up in the process of changing stuff up. And that's where it gets pretty darn exciting. Okay, um, Chris, great to see you. Rick, again, always a pleasure. I love seeing you guys engage. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name right. Breson? Breson? Uh, regard, I can say 79. Welcome, thanks so much. Uh, Sahara, what's going on? Great to see you, always a pleasure. Um, <laughs> so, you know, here's, here's the funny thing is, is that that's a great example. So, you know, the interesting thing is that part of my day was spent, let me hit the pause button. Let me frame this with a very specific point. Getting back to like, if it's anything re involving creativity, I'm only going to do it with the creative lens on. So part of my day was spent in MailChimp. I'm setting up, and I'm, this is not me trying to get you to sign up for my email list. But part of my day was spent kind of going into MailChimp, kind of going, how do I create a link to, that makes it easy for somebody to, for me to create a landing page that makes it easy for pe people to come in and, and do it? So I could have just kind of done some really boring thing, but I was like, no. Let me, and I'm, just so you know, like I am all about my iPhone. I, I have signed up for an iPhone photo taking class. I'm like three training things into it, but I've learned, let's see if I can do it right, something like this. There's a proper way to hold the iPhone such that, you know, you, you because most people actually just kind of do this with the iPhone. It's actually totally unstable when it's out there. So there's a certain way you kind of palm it like this, and then you support it like that, and then you take your shot without kind of putting your hand over the, over the lens there. And that way, what you're doing is you're kind of cradling this thing. <laughs> I know it sounds stupid, but... This is an integral part of everything that I do. So like the little 
uh, video placeholders or post stamps, whatever you call it. I'm always shooting these on this phone. And so the process of that, so, you know, I went out and did the same thing. I'm like, I'm going to shoot a photo that's going to be on a sign up page. And so it could have been a really mundane task because Melissa, my dear wife, and I talked through what it could have been. And initially, we were just going to put a link to a Google form. And I kind of went and looked at that. And I'm like, no. And that, you know, is, and so I was like, I've got to find a way to take a mundane task and turn it into a creative uh, journey. And so I ended up with something that I was way happier with that looked fun and is inviting. I had a chance to take a picture of an amp, you know, and I got to bring it in Photoshop and I got a chance to, you know, mess with the photo. And then when I placed that photo in the midst of that experience, and again, this is analogous to the practice you do before a midweek rehearsal, whatever. When I actually got to the moment of watching that all come together, I brought all that creativity with me into that, into what could have been a, you know, not the midweek rehearsal is a mundane experience, but the idea is I came in with that thing dripping with creativity before I even showed up and it actually, you know, kind of, I, I hit publish. And so I, I want to encourage you to think about that. So when it comes to updating your news, your username, you know, I had to go in and, and just do some stuff and seemingly mundane things, but we're surrounded by all these things where like, oh, what are people going to see when they're on the outside looking at it? So thanks for that. I appreciate that. Uh, okay. Apparently, uh, uh, oh, oh, that's Brett. Oh, silly me. Hi. <laughs> Uh, what's going on? Hey, Henry, how you doing? Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, um, Jim, the man, the myth, the legend himself. So, all right, so there's a classic example. Look at that photo. All right, and again, this is in no way uh, sliding anybody else. So, you know, I try and look at this in a non-competitive way because, honestly, competition, um, there are parts of my personality that can be competitive, and they usually don't lead me anywhere good. Just saying. Um, but I love that photo. You know, it's just like it's in the moment. Uh, you just know that whatever he's playing, it had to sound great, right? So, like, it totally pulls you in. I'm like, tell me more. Love that. Um, here we go. All right. Doug, speaking of inspiration, how much do you, uh, how much of the process do you find is tied to guitar tone? I find it extremely hard to be inspired when my tone is not good. <laughs> uh, I almost said something it wasn't intended to be snarky but it could have been received that way and it certainly wouldn't have been my heart uh, and I, I, it was basically like you think um, but you think it's really it, well, okay so there's two sides to this um, so this is me stepping into teacher Doug mode so just, just be prepared one of the things is that certain amplifiers when the tone isn't good they can really be kind of like that that brown paper bag, just that kind of wet, kind of like, I'm uninspired. I don't know what to do. I want to go to sleep. And I know that feeling because I've lived that, that feeling for decades, on and off. But at this point, I've become pre precocious enough with my guitar playing that I'm just kind of like, I'm not going to let those situations defeat me because... And this is really, and, I'm, and here's the thing, is that I totally get you. I mean, when the, when the tone is really stanky, there, there really isn't quite much you can do about it. But the other thing that I've learned is, and I had this journey, it points back, and this is where the gear plays a role in this. Uh, a worship leader, Scott House, at the old church that I used to be at, uh, Cornerstone Fellowship, kind of a mega church here in the Bay Area. And I had such a great time on that team, and Scott was a great leader, and I love that guy. But he loaned me uh, his Telecaster, and I had borrowed a, a Tweed amplifier, a 20, 2112, I think, was the model. Scott Bayer. Um, uh, and uh, it was this lovely Tweed amplifier. But I got to tell you, Tweed amps, they don't have reverb. And they basically are very, very fast in terms of the transient response. And I didn't know how to play that amplifier. And that amplifier was just, just kind of going, step back into the ring, Doppler. Come on. Bing! Down you go. Come on. You want some more? Back in, back. Down I went. Down I went. Down I went. Down I went. But I was like, I'm not giving up. And finally, I just kind of went, oh, this is who I need to be to play through this amplifier. And it's not like that amp had bad tone. It was just like, I just didn't know how to play it. Same thing with plugging straight into a Marshall. It's just like, you know, everybody, th th you know, they th we think of a Marshall, we think of Eddie Van Halen with all the delay and the reverb and all this stuff. Plugging straight into a Marshall is is like getting hit by a school bus. You know, it's just big and and it's unforgiving. 
Um, so you kind of have to learn how to do that thing and playing it, playing straight into a Marshall without any pedal whatsoever. You're going to very quickly learn what it's like to, again, just be run over by a school bus. Like, thanks for hawking. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's a whole experience. Uh, but at the end, you kind of walk out and kind of like, oh, I learned how to do that. And so, you know, Brett, I'm, I, here's the thing. You've been with us for, for a while here. So I obviously am not in any way doubting your ability to kind of step into a situation kind of, okay, I'm going to figure this thing out. But it is easy without the number of kind of like, after a bunch of times of just kind of going, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to let this thing make me suck. I've just kind of decided I'm going to learn to play my way through just about any rig you could plug me through. And I'm going to find that, that, that seam of gold and I'm going to grab it and I'm not going to let go of it. Um, but it's only because I've been beaten to pulp and it feels terrible when the tone is sucking and it feels terrible to go, I'm just the worst guitar player ever. And it feels terrible as you just kind of keep getting up off the floor and just kind of going, all right, we try that again. But the end result is if you keep kind of getting back up into the ring, you kind of begin to go, I figured that thing out. And then you kind of go, all those other ramps that like I didn't quite know how to do. And you know, part of it, as I will say, is, is a stylistic thing. Is it meant that I had to be willing to play whatever style that amp was telling me it really needed me to play. Or as I was trying to get whatever out, out of it was, I, how I needed to adapt my technique. And this is not directed to you, but I will say this. The number one, and I see people going, I don't like that amp. I don't like Vintage 30. You know, first of all, John Petrucci's tone is not sucking. Vintage 30 seemed to be working for him. Steve Vai's tone, uh, for most people, would agree that it's not sucking. Vintage 30 seemed to be working for him. So it's like, I don't like Vintage 30. And I'm like, you know, it may, and I'm not, again, this is not directed towards you, Brett. So let me be really clear. But sometimes people just kind of, and, and here's the thing. If you don't like a particular speaker, I get it. But like the kind of dismissive, you know, well, it's this and it's that. That's just, that's like fourth grade. I like Hot Wheels and not like Matchbox. Just like get over it. In any case, um, so you know there are there are multiple sides to it. But you know the, the the getting back into the ring and just kind of going, how am I going to find myself in the midst of this thing? Is my suggestion around that. Um, and, you know, I kind of almost take it like a challenge, not an ego thing, but I'm just kind of like, I'm precocious. I'm just kind of like, I am stupid enough to believe I'm going to find a good tone ultimately with any sound. And, and, I'm, and I just keep going back until I do. And that's not a capacity thing. It's a stupidity and just precociousness. I'm just going to keep going back until I find it. It's a great question. Um, I love that, Rick. Come on, bring it on. Uh, and, you know, I'll go there. Um, you know, here, here's the other thing is, is that uh, this is, thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. I'm going to talk on the anointing. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I've been immersed in video land, literally, insanely. No, it's fine. Okay. I always, I always check with the Holy Spirit, which again, may, you know, be a good thing to just point out, but, you know, I have literally been for the past week, basically been existing on four hours a night sleep uh, because I've been wrapping up this video on the quad cortex because I'm all in. And so the decision, but the other thing is, is that, that it's not me just kind of going, laboring away, another crossfade, another demo. All right, let me play a strat. Arr. It's me just going, this is awesome. Having the most amazing time getting the chance to hang out with gear and hang out with people. Like, I'd rather be sleeping? No. What am I going to do? Put on the TV and just kind of go, <laughs> just like, or I could be down here like, oh, isn't this cool? And that's the thing. It's not losing that inspiration. But one of the other things that, you know, and I'm, I'll call myself out in this, is when I'm really in the right place with God, like where I'm really spending a lot of time, which if you're working 20 hours a day, you're not going to be. Note to self. Um is that I'm constantly asking myself, what am I doing to stay and step into the anointing? Because ultimately, anything that I can do is this big compared to when God's anointing just falls. And you're just like, you know, it's just kind of like, it just directs you to be in the right place, 
to be prepared for that and 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 knowing and expecting that shouldering that that anointing is going to fall and you're ready to shoulder it right because that's a big thing anointing doesn't fall on uh, on shoulders that can't can't harness it and and can't stand that that weight now as it as it turns out you know i i i i try and live a life where i start my day in prayer i learned that from a, from one of my spiritual mentors uh, i i you know start in the bible and you know and i'm conscious of that but that's different than thinking overly over the course of the day where am i am i under the anointing am i am i am i have i stepped into that i'm fortunate enough that most of the time the, the answer is yes but when i'm super busy i'm not actively thinking that and you know the, the factoring God out in the busyness of life. Even if you start your day there, it happens, and it's a danger. Uh, and Melissa really kind of she had this uh, podcast that she'd listened to, and it was talking about kind of some of the signs when you're really, really centered on God, and when you're really just kind of distracted by the things in your life. So you know the, the, the creativity, you just want to watch out and make sure that it doesn't. Um, well, Siri is just kind of having a little festival down here. I have no idea why she's picking me up. I guess Siri's interested in the anointing as well. So just keep that in mind. You know, if you're chasing the anointing, it means you're going to be chasing the anointing that only God can give you, which means you're going to be chasing God. And and God has a great way of, of um, being incredibly attractive like that. So thanks for that, Rick. Great point. Um, uh, thank you, Rick, for your, for your comment. I'm not going to broadcast that. Uh, What's going on, Brad? Always a pleasure. Uh, and you know, you we were having some exchange, I think, on on the worship tutorials thing. And at the very last minute, I jumped off. So I I was starting. I meant to hit. I was meaning. No, I thought it was it was the other Brad. And I messaged Brad, and I didn't message you. That's what happened. So sorry about that. I saw you, and then of course the whole stream ended. All right. Um, uh, all right. Hey, what's going on, NTPL? Um, yeah, and and you know, he, here's here's the thing: is is it? And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna rabbit trail on this a little bit because it's a really good question. I'm glad I waited uh, to to delve. Uh, now that we're kind of past the kind of the key, if you will, uh, inspiration points. That's a good word. Um, so you know, here, here's the thing: is is that you're absolutely not wrong. This this is. Okay, let me break this down into a couple of different pieces. One, uh, I'm wanting to do something deep on the voice print DI, uh, which is basically uh, the LR bags that kind of enables you to kind of take the actual character of your instrument and then kind of with their app, make it such that it actually sounds like that instrument with a mic on it, uh, which is great except for the fact, as I've learned miking acoustic guitars, uh, over, over the process of working on this DPA mic video, that if your acoustic guitar doesn't sound good, putting a mic in front of it is not going to make it any sound sound any better. It's just going to let more people know how incredibly mediocre it is. And I have a number of really mediocre acoustic guitars, and, and as well as a really lovely old parlor guitar. But I just uh, it's it's it sounds better being played from above the sound hole than it does mic'd up. It's just it's just kind of the reality of that thing. It's a lovely, lovely instrument. So that said, um, I've actually reached out to those guys to just say, hey, can you send me some loner guitar that sounds great? Uh, so the, the point here is this, is that I've heard enough really mediocre acoustic guitars that you watch the sound tech just kind of go, how am I possibly gonna make this thing sound good? Um, and I'm not going to mention any brands. I've, I've stopped mentioning specifics because invariably whatever brand and model I mentioned, somebody's like, that's my guitar. Uh, and I never want people to feel bad. And, you know, it's, it's like it's, sometimes it's what people can afford. And then especially I don't want them to feel bad. Uh, so here's the thing is with acoustic guitars, it definitely is money. Um, because, you know, it's just a mediocre sounding acoustic guitar. It's either just kind of honky. It's just, it just... It just doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound pretty on the top end. It's a little pokey or honky in the mid range. The bottom end tends to be unfocused. So it's like, it's kind of like all the things that you don't want in a high end guitar all happening at the same time. It's really so, and, and there's really not much you can do about it. 
Then there's the other part of it is, is that there are the questions that we ask ourselves as guitar players, and I'm purposely leaving this comment up here. Um, it's like, you know, I've watched Joe Satriani play a, a huge range of instruments and it always sounds great. I'm just like, well, how much, and I'm again, I'm not calling anybody out, so I'm calling myself out. I'm like, well, how much of a wimp am I then? You know, what is it that I have yet to learn on the journey of guitar that prevents me from picking up any instrument and just sounding like I'm inspired and dialed in? I'm like, okay. And that's no to us, right? Like, so giant again, big bullet. What do we have to learn? Because again, sub, sub bullet to accomplish things, sub bullet one, we need to know what we're not able to do yet. Sub bullet two, who do we need to watch and learn from to learn how to do it? Sub bullet three, how much practice is it going to take? Sub bullet four, am I willing to invest the time? Then it becomes very practical. Here's the other thing uh, and, and kind of a, a, another point, but very important to that is that when it comes to the things creative, there are most most of us handle our creativity very differently than we handle the organizational side of what we do, which just means it can be very touchy-feely, which means that all the planning and all that stuff that we may do very well in the other areas of our lives sometimes immediately goes out the window. And most of the time, I'm kind of, so long as I create a structure, that then when I'm inside the framework of that structure, and sometimes the structure has to be the out growth of the creative process being expressed. And this gets me into a lot of trouble um, in that I'm working on a video project for the folks at Celestian. And I know, and I finally just articulated what I haven't been able to put into words. I know, and, and I, but I've, I've, I've kind of let them know that this is a process and they're fine with it. I'm giving you some, some insight perhaps maybe more than I should, but but I think they would be happy to know that I'm talking about the fact that they make amazing FRLR speakers that every worship musician should have. There you go. Um, but the idea is, is that for me to tell that story, I have to tell it on the opposite side of a creative creative journey. I have to be on the, uh, I have to have gotten on that creative lake, sailed to the other side, and then can look back on that experience or else my video is going to be like everybody else's video. Like, well, here's the frequency spectrum and it does this and it does that. I'm like, I'm just like, no. And it's one of the reasons that I, I just, I think I just kind of, God gave me the download. Well, what are you new here? He's like, well, of course, haven't you figured this out? And sometimes with the creative stuff, we just don't see the stuff that's in front of us. But one of the reasons why these videos sometimes take so long is I, I choose in some of these, just about all of them, to take a creative journey such that I can then tell the story through the lens of that creative journey. Because until you've taken a creative journey with a piece of gear, you're incapable of telling the, the creative journey, which means I'm just kind of like, oh, I'm giving you feature sets and and something else, and and you know, I'm giving you some opinion that's not grounded in, in artistic reality. Who am I then? I'm not anybody that I want to follow. I don't want to follow that guy. Uh, and, I, and let me be real clear. I'm not saying that's how the other people that are out there that are like the Rebeas and, and you know, th th there are just so many people in the gear space that are doing great work. But every so often you will see, and I'm not saying this about Rebeas, so I'm going to be really clear, you will see somebody in that space get up and start talking about some piece of gear that they're really just kind of going through the motions. They haven't gone on a creative journey with it. Um, and, and it's because sometimes you're not afforded the ability to do that, which is why, you know, um, you know, th th it's just, but it's when you understand the point wrapping all that stuff up. When you understand what your creative process actually looks like, you can decide what pieces of that, if any, are too dysfunctional to keep around and or how you manage your relationships such that you let people know. For example, if you're the music director, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna bring it down here and we're gonna sit for about four bars. We're talking about in a rehearsal, pre-service run through. We're going to sit for four bars. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look around and we're going to all kind of look and we're going to find the first person that's going to come in. Then we're going to look around and we're going to decide the next person. 
what you're doing is you're stepping into a zone of creativity where it's it's a creative collective a, a, a creative creative collective consciousness and that's not something we do a lot with worship teams but it's one of the things that happens in free worship is that there's a lot of unspoken communication when we do the the quickie rehearsal and the quickie run through and all of that we totally don't leave room for i'll just say it for those of us that subscribe to this thing we don't leave room for the holy spirit to move in the in the framework of an arrangement and, and all of that i'm just like well, what's that you know and here's the thing is there on either side of 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 this thing there is extreme which is like we only you know we there, <laughs> uh let me see if i can say this without offending anybody First of all, whatever works for you and however God moves in your life, who am I to say? So let's be clear there. But at either end, you can have it overly sterile, or if you're not careful, you're so busy chasing the experience that the experience becomes the goal versus actually bringing everybody together with God. It, 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 that's the best way I can articulate it. I think you know my heart around that. So the point being is, is that finding those, being aware, and sometimes we're not going to be able to actually cash that check. And it comes at a pain. And I'm I'm not a good person to sit on a team when I see those types of opportunities being missed. But that's a journey God has taken me on. I understand that. Um, that is to say, sometimes you kind of go, man, if we only did X, 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 and I could give you a list of 10 things uh, that, of what that would be with tremendous amounts of detail around each one. Um, and most of the time, maybe one of those things might be considered and the rest would be like, yeah, we're, we're too busy. I'm like, how can you be too busy? And then I kind of just have to live with that and just kind of grow through that. That's just been my journey with God. But we're all, when we start becoming really aware of the creative side, when we're when we're stepping into it collectively as a team and when we're not, um, we kind of begin to kind of go, wow, there were some missed opportunities. And that's just part of the journey. It's just kind of going, I just got to keep my mouth shut sometimes and just kind of go, this is, this is what the people in authority have chosen to do. And that's on them. Uh, and it may or may not be appropriate for me to speak my piece, but you know what? I'm going to do my best possible job. So again, I'm going to have already brought in my creative experience. The time I sat here in this chair, playing through those arrangements, just doing that, when that comes onto the platform with me, everybody feels it. So I'm bringing that already, just like, boom, that comes there. And when that gets unleashed on the platform, what it does is everybody gets a little dose of that that creativity. And that's a, that's one of the ways that we can do it, even in environments that aren't great for that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> that is to say, um, the tone of the instrument and, you know, and, and evoking the parts is like, if I'm trying to create some great ambient thing and all I've got is a, a strat, how am I going to learn to, I realize it's super quiet. And a little out of tune. The moral of the story, without being a jerk about it at all, is sometimes all we... Well, oh, that's right. What do they say? Uh, I, I was on some photo, video thing. Like, what's the what's the best lens to have? The ben, best lens to have? The one that's in your hand. <laughs> it's like, that is all we've got. So I, I am, again, not being a jerk. So let me be really clear. But sometimes that all we've got is what's in our hand. So... Sometimes we've just got to figure out how am I going to do it with what I've got to work with. And I think, um, and 
again, when thinking about in the world of sub bullets, I don't need to go through them. How do I need to change my approach, change what I'm thinking about doing such that in just about any situation, I can just kind of go, I'm going to find that thing and I'm going to, I will have done enough of that repeatedly that I, I think in any situation I can just kind of go, I'm going for it. And guess what? Sometimes the bottom falls out and it sucks. But the other thing is, is that stepping out in faith. I think of that scene in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark where he's kind of throwing the stuff out across the, the divide there. Harrison Ford, that is. You know, at the end where it's like, you've chosen wisely. You know, um, sometimes we just have to take that first step of faith, right? You know, just kind of going, I believe God's going to show up there. And again, that's where that anointing thing is so important, right? Part of why I can sit here for seven days, four hours a night sleep, and just take that step of faith. I'm like, I'm going to find that thing. 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 As I believe that I'm pressing into a zone, zone where I already know the anointing is going to be there. I'm stepping in with the confidence that that's there because of, of who I am in my life. Hopefully that all translates. And I mean the all part, not the, the guitar part. Uh, what's going on, Deanne? Okay. So, um, I hope that made sense. That was a nice rabbit trail. Uh, uh, oh wow! Okay, same setup for eight years. Okay, so you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go there. Um, so I'm as guilty as anybody. All right, because quite often I'm privileged enough that there's enough new gear that comes through here that sometimes, well, no, there's a constant new source of some variation in sound and whatnot. So what happens when I go back to the old gears as a guitar player? Guess what? I put my hands in the same places, on the same strings, in the same locations, playing the same stuff. Guilty as charged. So again, this is where this, like, how do I find this other stuff? Um, Tony Robbins would call it pattern interrupt. That is to say, it's like you take a, a, a record, a, an LP for those of us who uh, remember those. It's called a long playing recording. And you basically take the needle and you just scratch that recording. So it just can't play in that groove just on that little path over and over. So the idea is like, well, how do I change it up? Um, and, you know, again, I'm going first person, but that's all I can do. As a gear demonstrator, I am I'm in, in a pretty prolific moment of my gear demonstrating, which means I'm constantly creating. But the danger of that is all of us kind of have the repetitive things that we play. So how do I make it such that in this video and in that video and this video and that video, I'm not playing the same shtick over and over because guess what? People will stop lifting and they're just like, the guy just repeats himself. I heard that three videos ago. Why do I possibly want to listen to that? And the, again, the answer to that is we look for new sources of inspiration in Scrapbook. It's guaranteed way to just get the brain going. I'm thinking something new, which means I'm going to be reacting with something new. I'm not saying that you're not thinking about doing that, but I, I absolutely feel you. Um, and, you know, and, and the new gear part of it is a huge part of it. But until the new gear and or the funding thereof comes... I encourage you to just kind of go, what can I listen to? How can I listen to it that can allow me to come back to this instrument and do something that I wouldn't have done otherwise? Um, and, you know, I, I will challenge myself to do that. But again, the other part of it is like, and, you know, some of that, you know, it's just like, you know, we kind of know that money plays a role in it, right? You know, but we're not always kind of consciously going, well, okay, well, wait a second. And I'm, again, I'm not, I don't know you, quote unquote, well enough to to be in your head, duh. But let's just imagine that, like, I am mini Brett. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I know that I have X amount of money. This is, this is what I'm thinking about buying. And until then, blah, blah, blah. So it may or may not be accurate, but for somebody out there, it is. At some point, you do or do not give yourself permission to go, well, there, this is what I would do on the new gear. So what do we need to do to do it on on the old gear, right? And and it's actually one being really conscious of the fact that like wow, at a certain point I say yes, and sometimes at a certain point I don't allow myself to do stuff. What am I not allowing myself to do? Is it dependent on having new gear? And if it is, you know, it, does that really make the most sense for my my internal health as a guitar player and my growth as a musician and for the fact that like you know. Well, what happens when I, you know, kind of play through that stuff for eight years? By the way, I commend you on the fact that as a worship guitar player, you've actually used the same gear for eight years. That's a virtual fist bump and high five. Uh, you have not followed the the Strymon Lust path of like, this is the latest compressor that everybody's got to have. 
It was a deep six, and now it's this, and what's this? And no, got to have the stride, man. No, 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 you got to have the quad vortex. No, you got to have this. Uh, you know, it's just like, holy cow, it's dizzying. And um, although on one hand, I understand it. On the other hand, you know, um, you've obviously been kind of working through getting, honestly, the full value out of the gears. So there you have it. Sorry for me, uh, rabbit trailing. Uh, uh, Rick, I love the fact that you guys are, are hanging out uh, in, in the chat and, and also making commenting. And you know that I'm reading that stuff as I'm going through it, though. Uh, and thank you, my friend. Uh, you know, here, here's the other thing. I, I'll take that. You know, um, hang on. I wonder if I can actually... Uh, let's see here. All right, so here it is, film and music. Okay, now I don't know about you, but I am, it's so, I, what I'm about to say, somebody will get and somebody will be like, I have no idea what he's talking about. I am a font boy. A font boy is someone uh, who absolutely loves fonts. That creates a feeling for me, that imagery, that whole thing, the way they left the white space down below there. The funny thing is that looks an awful like a worship musician cover uh, except for the fact that, you know, our logo doesn't go across the top, but, you know, this across the bottom. But this would have been after we did the redesign. But the point being is you can see what would appeal about, about this to me, the great use of a font. So the idea is I'm constantly just going, what, I mean, look, you know, look at this. Like, what sort of mad creative thought, that's all we're going to have on two pages. And by the way, that costs a heck of a lot of money. But it's somebody that is thoroughly sold out for the creative process, right? I mean, you're just kind of like, and as a musician, I'm constantly looking for somebody that's going to walk me through the creative process and just kind of get me thinking about something from a perspective that I wouldn't have seen otherwise, right? Look at that. Keep moving. I mean, you know, and look at how clear that is. You know, you got your head, subhead, and your body copy. I mean, it's just like, the point being is, is that that gives me such a lift so whether it's listening to some Hendrix or listening to some U2 or listening to some Hillsong or some Bethel or some Elevation or you know whatever it might be you know uh, or just sitting there like Steve Vice like I'm just gonna look at the guitar you know and documenting the things and making a note so you can come back to that uh, is a really important part of the process uh, Friedman, yes, Larry Mitchell is a monster guitar player. I'm going to come back to you in a second there, uh, but I just wanted to, to, I'm kind of going back and forth here in a classic Doug kind of way. Thanks again, Fishman Guitar. Appreciate it. Uh, ooh. Wow. Ooh, getting to know you. Um, all right, you know, uh, boy, um, there's so much there. I'm, and this is one, one of the things that um, I, I, I don't spend enough time really appreciating. Uh, guitar, and this is the thing about music that is really special, especially about playing the guitar for me, at least. And I'm going to believe for you, but I don't want to speak for you. Um, guitar enables me to put words, musical words, through the guitar to emotions that I can't always find the words to express or find the person to say them to. You know, when I'm in having a great season, I can only talk so much about how things are going. When I'm having a bad season, I can only talk or complain for so long before people are just like, you know what? I don't want to hear anymore. Uh, and I'm generally not that guy, but, you know, if I'm honest. Um, so your, your point there is, is really an important one because the thing is, is that first of all, what I love is like, you know what? I put it down while my kids were little because I made that that sacrifice. I can tell you, one is is that you know um, I'm believing that your kids didn't pay the price. What you did is you made the choice. I'm going to spend invest that time in my, in my kids, and that uh, generational investment will yield dividends long after you're gone. Um, and so and sometimes the things that that we have to put down that we love, it comes as a cost. But ultimately, what we've purchased with that cost is 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 far greater uh and you know it, it it you're not really giving anything unless it comes at a cost it's easy to give away something that you know somebody gave you you know that you got at some you know christmas thing you know oh, everybody exchanged gifts oh I'm going to a christmas party i'll just give that you know give it away 
you know, uh, but giving away something that, that, putting down something that means something greatly to you is huge. But the, the, the other thing that I want to unpack from there is we are so fortunate to be able to express ourselves, and I don't care how well you play, when nobody's there, the door is closed, or the door is closed and everybody else is down the hall, there are things and experiences we have with the instrument that are just there. There's no other way to express them for me. Uh, and that's such a gift from God. You know, I, I, I just want to encourage each of you to just really treasure and cherish that. Because, um, you know, arguably on, on this list that I put together should have been kind of like, what does it mean to you in terms of your relationship with God? And what does it mean to God? Uh, I remember Bruce saying, Adolf, uh, the publisher of Fortune Musician, talking about playing for an audience of one. And I really loved the way he said that. I was like, wow. It was so beautiful. And it was so the antithesis of the way I thought. I was like, I was jealous of what he had. But I also was mindful of like, what he had is something that I could attain attain and step towards. So just want want to want I want to I want to encourage and gently challenge each of you to kind of go where are you at with the appreciation of of this gift of this music, right? Because it it is a gift. Think about you know I think about what how could I express these things? So, Alan, I'm glad to see you uh, uh, back there. And and you know, the great thing is is that the other thing that happens in those bad seasons. I just want to encourage anybody that's going through a tough season. That's where you know we want, we don't have the mountaintop experiences. Because you can't just stay on the mountain. It doesn't work like that. You got to come back down, crawl through the valley, and climb the next mountain. And sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Those analogies have, you know, they're they're there for a reason. But ultimately, to climb back up for it, and I list is one of my favorite phrases, peak experience. You got to kind of go back into the valley to, to go for that. And sometimes, you know, um, it's in those valley floor experiences where God. Uh, either does or doesn't have our attention, but he's really just kind of going, there are some lessons you're going to have to learn before you're going to get up to that next mountaintop. And it's not like God doesn't want us to get to the mountaintop. He just doesn't want to let us go from mountaintop to mountaintop without actually learning the thing that he needs for us to be able to get the next higher peak. He doesn't just want to go from, us. You know, that's not what he wants for us. I firmly believe that. He doesn't want a life of mediocre, mediocrity. He doesn't want us on, on the valley floor because everyone he wants to teach us. And a good father wants to make sure his children learn so, so they can flourish. And so that each next peak, and they're not always going to be like this, and this is why it gets back to this. I, I mentioned this before. Um, where are you? Born to others. There we go. Celebrate your victories. Oh, I had jam in that one as well. I see what I've done. I've cut and pasted that guy. Celebrating your victories is one of the most important things you can do. And some people are, are ball busters, not to other people, but to themselves. Uh, and don't do it. Just the bait of Satan to beat yourself up. That's, you know, God doesn't beat, beat us up. So let's see, then who does that leave? Just saying. So, you know, it's so important to celebrate your victories because otherwise, you know, like I said, if you look at the amount of time we spend on the valley floor, you know, and how much time we actually spend on the mountaintop, most of the time's on the valley with learning the lessons and preparing to climb you know, to that next peak. But if we don't celebrate what we learned and overcame in the valley on the way up the mountain, that by the time we come down the next mountain, we will have just kind of gone, yeah, whatever, that was another mountain. And that's what, you know, here's, here's the thing. I remember Steve Vai at one of these guitar camps talking about, you know, and, and, you know, my guess is most of the people on this feed, on this live stream, would love to have a career in music, getting paid lots of money to travel all around the world, to have the, in a healthy way, the adulation of hundreds, thousands, and or millions of fans, you know, never have to worry about having enough money to pay rent or pay for food, or pay for your kid's college, or whatever it is that you, you know, you worry about on a day-to-day, -day or week-to-week, -week or month-to-month, -month or year-to-year -year basis. But, you know, one of the things that Steve said is there are people that just hate it, because they've just had the wrong attitude, and they've thought the wrong things. They And he said they actually start to resent their fans. And Steve I is a guy that, first of all, um, by the way, um, if you haven't seen the knapsack video, and you want to just, like, eat or feel... 
uh, I, I won't say I felt dejected. I just felt like I had, I had stepped into the ring with, uh, uh, what's the name, Butterbean? Uh, you know, at, but it was a it was a good whooping. Uh, it's what Steve Vai can do with one hand uh, on the guitar is nothing short of whooping. But I was just reminded, it's like that's why Steve Vai. The, the The point being is is that the his comment about ultimately some of these artists resenting their fans. He's a guy that really knows. He's a super smart guy, very introspective. And that means that he will have, will have noticed this over years and decades of his career. And if he says that, that really stood out to me. I was like, huh, he's talking about one, he's talking about a couple of somebodies who've had real careers and they've hated it because they didn't actually see it as a blessing of God. You know, so it's an interesting thing. All right, let me head back to the right. I think that was, no, no, no. No, you know what? I'll stay there. Fine. I'm gonna I'm gonna banish. I somehow cut and pasted gems. Uh, there we go. All right. Let's take a look. Um. All right, Friedman. Hey, uh, you're having a, a a good old time over there on Facebook. Let's see here. All right. Uh. Ooh, ho, oh, oh. ho. All right, so I can't pull in Friedman's comment, but I can say uh, read what he says. I, I'm not quite inspired on the reverbs on the quad cortex, Doug, to be honest. I'm more interested in, in Helix reverbs. There's a quote for you. I love that. Uh, I'll share that with my, my Helix friends uh, at Line 6, that is. For uh, for me, a good-sounding reverb on, uh, on the House of Worship is a very important. Uh, so I am using uh, Guitar Rig 6 plug-in. It sounds great. What do you think about it? Guitar Rig stuff is great. Um and uh, so, you know, the interesting thing is, is that uh, my favorite line six verb is actually, I'm 90% positive it's called the octave verb. And you can only find it, I forget what the folder is for uh, for old reverbs. It's like where old reverbs go to not die. Uh, but they, they, uh, they've got a name of that folder. You have to, uh, to dig into it. Uh, but the, the octave verb is just... I still love it. Every so often I pull it out and people are like, what's that? It's just a great reverb. Line 6 is just, you know, they they just, you know, I'll just say it. In many ways, they have been the, the sound of the house of worship. Not exclusively so. AC30s and, you know, obviously Gretsch's and, 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 and Strymon played a big role. But Line 6 is, you know, especially the newer reverbs are all great. Um, so, yeah, you know, the... the um, I, you know, Friedman, I kind of love everything. So I'm like a kid with a puppy. It's like I could come home with a new puppy every day. I'm like, Mom, look, I got a new puppy. And you'd be like, uh, we have a, a thousand dogs in the kennel and back. Uh, this isn't working that great. Um, and and I grew up to be the kid with, with a thousand grown-up dogs in the kennel. Uh, and yes, Larry Mitchell is phenomenal. Guitar rig's great. Uh, excellent, excellent, excellent f um platform okay uh <laughs> oh man uh wow starving um kind of makes me sad but honestly i kind of picked that up a little bit as well and not that like you seem like you're starving but when i i noticed a a huge uptick in the number of people coming over from the tuesday night stream to saturday i'm just like and it's not like i have this massive following such that you know all of a sudden there's fifty thousand new people and I don't, honestly, I care about the people, not the numbers. But all of a sudden, I'm like, that's a Tuesday guy. That's a Tuesday woman. That's a Tuesday guy. I'm like, okay, they're hungry. And so, um, but I'm also sad that, you know, somehow in the house of worship, we haven't figured out a better way of pouring into one another. Uh, so, we, you know, that's kind of, I guess that's a big part of why I do this. Uh, and I am grateful that you're fired up. That is so awesome. That's the reward right there, um, or one of the rewards. Um, but but you know, it also makes me a little sad because I think about, you know, honestly, you know, the, the thing about this environment is we honestly want to find a way of, of being able to talk about some of the stuff that honestly, is probably not a good idea to post on your social media. And sometimes you just don't find the ears to hear in church. And there are things that we do miss. And again, you know, like uh, that, you know, the. For me, I, I, I've known some of the Hillsong folks long enough 
Uh, and my my wife, as you probably heard me say, was a Hillsong girl. She used to sing with Darls, is on some of, of the albums, uh, not only as part of the choir, but as part of like a, a group of BVs that was sang with Darlene in the studio. So, you know, I grew up as a Christian around the Hillsong folks. Um, Nigel and Chislet, are, I would consider them friends. And I think they might consider me a friend. Uh, but the point being is, is that, you know, they knew how to leave the Holy Spirit time to ruminate and to sit in moments. Um, and, you know, the, and that's in the DNA of that music. And that's why that music ruminated and continues to do so much because you could really feel that there were times that they would just go into free worship and they would let the Holy Spirit move, right? And, you know, the elevations kind of in many ways are kind of like a second generation of inspiration from that. I mean, I hear elevation, I'm like, you know, uh, I can, it, it's kind of like, for me, hearing Carlos Santana and then listening to Peter Green. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to Black Magic Woman uh, by Fleetwood Mac, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so the point being is just that, and there's nothing wrong with inspiration. It's a great thing. Um, but, you know, it 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 is that ruminating on the Holy Spirit and letting that time fall is great. So I'm super glad to hear that. So thank you, Alan. That, that, that means the world. Uh, JJ! Oh, dude! Woohoo! Thank you. I uh, warm. Uh, it's a, a slightly awkward phrase, but I'm just going to go there. That warms the cockles of my heart. So, uh, and there are those. The cockles are a real thing. Those are the inner sanctum things where the blood flows, but really does. So there's no other way to describe that. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't do it for the reward, but it sure feels good when people appreciate what you do. That's an important thing. And yet, uh, you know what? That needed to be another one appreciating others, right? We don't do uh, 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 enough to celebrate not only our own victory, uh, and it's actually something I, w I will say, you know, it's, it's I'm going to rabbit trail briefly on that. Um, it's something I got from my mom. She's really good at it, um, which is celebrating other people. And it's it's one of those things about, um, about that's a gift that you can give to somebody. So I was on this this thing that was being pre-recorded for, for, that I was on with Larry Mitchell yesterday. And it's going to be coming out about, uh, wait for it, 60 watt guitar amp, power amp, 60 watts. We'll be getting to this in, in some demo stuff. I'm um, doing some work for Celestian. And this invariably is going to be in, in some of the demos. But I was, uh, so it was AIM. Uh, these guys make these, these crazy, this is the GA60 Extreme. They, Larry Mitchell has a signature 120 watt version of one of these. So we were doing uh, this video thing for them. And I had a chance to kind of introduce Larry Mitchell and talk about all the things that I love about Larry. And it, it was it was so neat because not that Larry needs me to do that because everybody loves Larry, but it was such a privilege to actually, given the depth of field I have for him and the inspiration that he's had, to actually be able to go, boom, boom, boom. And in my experience with Larry Mitchell, I'm going to rabbit trail, uh, which... Of, of, something I'm good at, which is why I saved this stuff for the latter part of the, of the stream, is that I first saw Larry Mitchell, I think he said it was in 88, 89. I always, in my mind, it keeps being 85, so every time he tells me, I manage to forget, which is really lame. Uh, I'm actually a pretty good listener, but it was at the Ibanez booth at the NAMP show, and I just, and there was Larry playing through this Mesa Boogie quad uh, preamp and, you know, some sort of power amp playing through an S-series guitar. And, and this would have been, quote, unquote, a young Larry Mitchell. And I was just like, oh, this guy's smooth. He was really, 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 really good. I was like, wow. He had smooth then. You know, he's super smooth now. He's just, he continues to evolve. He's got a Grammy. Uh, he's a brilliant musician and a lovely guy. But I was like, you know, well, this is when I first met Larry and blah, blah, blah. And he's at the Vi Camp and everybody loves Larry. And he does this and his tone's amazing and his playing is amazing. And, you know, and I kind of went down the list and, and there's nothing like having somebody who really knows you and has paid attention to what you're doing actually speak those words that are an accurate or at least somewhat accurate uh, assessment of who you are and what you've done and speak them accurately in out of affection and spontaneously because I hadn't planned on doing it. Because you just it, it and, and the spontaneity helps, but sometimes we 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 just need to do it non-spontaneously. We're just kind of going, this is who this is, and this is why you mean this to me. 
uh, and it just was was such a, a gift. And I just, I, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it because I was like, well, I was kind of looking down when he does this. And I was looking at the camera. And I look over, and Larry's got this lovely look on his face. And, you know, it's just um, that gift of, of, of kind of cloaking somebody in praise. Heartfelt praise is a priceless gift because it lifts people up. And, you know, I'll say this about worship teams. is 90% of the time you have no idea what's really going on with the people that you're on the platform with. We, again, this is one of the, the challenges about kind of like we're on, we're off. And it's one of the reasons that I would argue that it might not be a bad idea to have the members of the worship team be in their own life group slash community group. And usually, you know, there are, there are church leaders that push back on that. But the reality is, is that, that that, and I can understand why, because, you know, first of all, their wives, you know, do they come to that group or do the wives hang out with the people that are in their social, you know, or excuse me, wives and husbands. I didn't mean it like that. I'm a dude, so I have a wife. So uh, what I was saying is, is that, you know, do the spouses come or whatever they do? And I caught myself, fortunately. But the point being is, is that, that if we had a chance to really unpack, and that's why I, lo I love team nights. Uh, but if we had a chance to unpack what's going on in each other's private lives, we could be much more connected and look out for each other. I think there's so many reasons why I think that's an advantage versus a disadvantage. So there. Um. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a funny thing. It's like, I think the chorus is on its way back. What is, is it the Julia? Dude, have you heard the Julia pedal? Holy cow, is that an amazing chorus. So yeah, the other place, and you know, I'm sure you know this since you're talking about chorus. First of all, just in case anybody out there didn't know this, chorus is really a, if you think about a long delay and you can add modulation to that, you just make that a short delay and that is what chorus is. So if you listen to a stereo chorus and just one side, this is, I love doing this and usually people are not nearly as enamored with it as I'm, but if you listen to just the, the chorus side of a stereo chorus over here, you'd be like totally seasick but against the direct signal it totally is this amazing thing it's just one of those things that psychoacoustically you even though you're you're hearing you know the sound and then against it somehow the blend just is magical so um the julia chorus is very very special all right um ooh, i'm gonna talk my love language Signature parts in worship song, then find a way to make it me. Yep, I learn new fingerings and add my nutty self in the mix for better or worse. I'll celebrate that. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, oh, there we go. Are we going to talk about the Mike Landau, um, uh, the Landau chorus? Hang on, hang on. Uh, Mason Vertex does a mod on that. Uh, the uh, Arian, there we go. The Arian chorus, ah, there we go. Uh, name that chorus for $100. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I I think that the GoTo 510 is what's on the Andy Timmons guitar that I've got here. Um, and I do not know the Vegatrem or the Vegatrem. So hang on, let's see if I can actually... No, I can't. Uh, hold on. I can make a note, though. Uh, uh, to be continued. I'll take a look. Um, uh, thanks for that. I'm pretty sure that the um, the 510, is, again, is what's on the uh, Andy Timmons guitar. Uh, and that guitar is here. Um, and so I'm going to be playing it real soon. Uh, and I think that's what's on there. Um, and it certainly seems to be working for Andy. So uh, I guess I got a little bit of research to do. Thank you for that. Um, oh, I love it. Look at this. Uh, yep, 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 yep. There you go. Uh, we got a Rush fan here. Uh Oh, I'm I'm not going to embarrass myself in it. Uh, well, how about that? <laughs> that one I'll do. Uh, it's 
So what's so funny is for those of us that are, are old enough before everybody had like five delays, when I was in seventh grade, maybe eighth grade, my buddy um, showed me, uh, he, he, he turned me on to Rush. All the world's a stage, and I and you know of course Alex Lifeson used the Echoplex on that part, and of course you know if you were lucky you had a fuzz box then you know uh, or an OD850 or something so you know that was a I was never that good because I always made each repeat the same volume, but that's so funny I love that oh man uh, okay good good good. Oh, the worship tutorial guys. Um, you know, the, it's it's a funny thing. It's like, it, and now I probably do it because I just kind of have to. But they're on my mainstream show on Saturday. Uh, I basically mention them every week. Uh, their sound design is phenomenal, uh, and they're just absolutely great guys. And actually, I just need to give a giant shout out. Uh, if any of you end up watching the Quad Cortex video I did, I've got some new cameras, uh, and basically Brian uh, Wall. If it weren't for him, I would have had no idea what I was doing. The camera, between the camera settings and then actually working in DaVinci Resolve, which is what I moved over to Blackmagic. Um, not the best name for something for Christian, but like the Blackmagic cameras, and they're unreal. Okay, so you know what? Here we go. So I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is, this is, I stepped into this, so I'm just going to say this. Sometimes you got to spend money to get a particular vibe if you're going for it. And sometimes to do that, you know, you've got to do it. I mentioned it before with the acoustic guitars, right? Um, but, but these guys and DaVinci Resolve, breaking stuff again, um, just completely transformed my world. And Brian has just been, he invested a bunch of time in walking me through the camera, uh, walking me through uh, how to set stuff up in DaVinci Resolve. And just, if you'd seen, no, it, 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 if you had the misfortune of seeing the train wreck I would have created without the input of what he get, he enabled me to do versus the outcome of the, that video, which is his hand is all over that. Um, in that, you know, about a month before he just, he spent an hour and a half with me, just walking me through how to set stuff up, let me record it on Zoom. And it's just been kind of there as I needed and, and, and about how to set up the cameras and all of that stuff. I am just so indebted to him, but but kind of you know, every week I'm always mentioning them on the mainstream show, and it's it's just because they have been such contributors and they have such a great heart. So yeah, um, those guys are amazing. And yes, 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 uh, Rebecca, what's going on? How you doing? Welcome aboard. Um, and if you've been on the show before and I forgot, my apologies. In any case, hi. So. Uh, So that's an interesting point. I'll take that bait. Now, again, Brett, so I, I'm just going to believe that you and I are, get, are getting to know each other well enough, and you set me up with all these great opportunities, so I'm just going to, I'm going to charge ahead. First of all, uh, I, I told, this is an interesting, interesting thing, is, is that um, the, the poor amplifiers, um, you know, if you do not have a facility big enough to sequester, you can see, see, right? there is an amp booth and it's about i don't know about four feet tall by about six feet long and about four feet wide it's big and i have it here in case i just need to have something that i need to do something that it just needs to be in there which means it's really loud because i do loud here <laughs> um but, you know, the thing is, is that if you don't have something like that or a room that, you know, or some place where, the, you know, you can st you know put some foam or something that's far enough away from the platform, it kind of means whether you like it or not, you're going in the box. Um, and, you know, here's the thing. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a modeling fanboy. But if I weren't, I'd totally be with you. I'd be just like, I'm a pedal, I'm a pedal guy. Give me some pedals on my amps. How am I supposed to do my thing without my stuff? Um and I and I and I totally get it. And it's an interesting process, right? You know, um, and it may, you know. So I'm curious, Brett. You may. Uh, oh, there we go. So I've. Uh, there, oh, there we. Ah, ah. 
you know, that's interesting. I was about, I was, it was coming back to me, the GT100. I was about to get, like, what are you using? I'm like, wait a second. No, no, no. I remember now. Uh, and there it is. So, um, so, you know, the, the, um, I've actually, this is, this is me getting busy. I started a series of videos on the GT1000 core that, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Siri, you are on crack. What do you think about that, Siri? Feeling bashful now. You crashed the live stream. You got to have something to say. That is so strange. I told you I saw Siri kind of like woohoo over my phone, and now she's on my computer, just kind of going. That was just totally weird. Just like, all right. In any case, as I was saying before, Siri uh, decided she wanted. Hmm. To... I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? You can have a nice night. Okay. Is there something I can help you with? No. Okay. Totally bizarre. We've had a visitation from Siri. Uh, so, all right. Uh, the um, so I, I started, and I'm about. I was just thinking about that uh, earlier today. I started a series of videos on the Boss GT1000 core. Oh no 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 no. She's back. Oh no 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 no. What what? I didn't get that. No. Could you try again? Okay, hang on, hang on. Um, how am I going to get her to go away? Can I quit? Siri, how can I quit you? All right, let's just believe she's just gone bye-bye. Wow. Um, focus, Fox. The idea of... I, I started a series on the GT1000 core... You might want to check that out. Uh, you know, since you've already lived in Boss World, I used uh, I've I've just used the Boss stuff on a bunch of stuff, um, and the GT1000 core is a phenomenal piece of gear. I think it, in my opinion, um, it's as good as any of the other stuff that's out there. Just say it. Uh, and Boss does not get a lot of love. It's not really kind of with the the cork sniffer. You know, I got to have a you know thousand dollar compressor crew. It's not it's not cool. Uh, actually, Brian Wall just bought, bought uh, an old school uh, DD500 belt because he was like, I'm going pedals. So just so you know, you're in good company. Um, the point being is, is that I'm going to come back. I got into this. I have like this. It's 30 minutes already in the can of this video. And I got to the section on, on MIDI implementation. So I'm going to be coming back to that. But um, that video series, and it's on YouTube.com slash Doug Doppler. You might want to visit that and just check that out. Uh, it, it is the technology is great. Also, the other thing about it is the guy that's involved with lots of tube amp expanders. His name is Jeff Slingluff. He's a brilliant guy. He also did the M300 reverb for MXR. He also did the DL6 and this thing called the HD500 for Line 6. He's been involved in a bunch of stuff that Worship Guys use, and he's a lovely guy. So he and I are kind of doing that series together, so I just got to revisit that. But that might be a, a great option, and it's small, and it sounds great. The only thing about it is that like HX Stomp, it's a smaller form factor, which means you don't have a bunch of buttons. So a big part of what's going into this next one of these, that, like I said, I've got 30 minutes of content shot, and 30 minutes of content edited is hours of work. Um, but the idea is there's a, a the Morningstar MC6, and there's also an MC8. Those are brilliant MIDI controllers, and so using a smaller form factor where, you know, if you don't need the a bunch of the extra pedals and or you can augment it with something like the MC6, uh, is a great way to approach that strategically. So, um, in any case, you know, the, the idea of isolating the amplifiers and, and all of this, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, the reality is, is that if we had non-volunteer sound techs who could do a better job on a professional level, some of the decisions we make about what we do and how we do it would be different. The other other part of it is, is if we had more professional drummers that knew how to hit at a volume that was appropriate for the room and for our live stream slash broadcast mixes, some of the problems we encounter 
we wouldn't have to deal with as well. That is to say, when musicians know their gear well enough and know how to keep it at a reasonable level, we're able to do things in a quote-unquote professional way. But the reality is a lot of what we do at church, that's not the goal, that's not how we do things. And so sometimes there are compromises that we have to make. Um, and not using amplifiers is is increasingly one of those compromises that get made. So I, I don't necessarily know if I have an answer other than just kind of like, yeah, I do. I know exactly what answer I've got for you. You want to find, and Brad, I don't know where you're based. You want to fi find somebody who's got a, a Rev G, a D10, sorry, Rev D20 amplifier. You may have exactly what you're looking for in that amplifier. It's a two preamp, two power amp. You can go out after the preamp or the power amp. It's got direct out, so you have your tube amp. It sounds great. It basically is two notes embedded technology, and it's brilliant. So that's another way that you can go that's going to allow you to run your pedals into the front end. Ooh. And then all that stuff into, into uh, you know, and there's an effects loop, uh, and there's a, an XLR out to go front of house. I have two of them because I'm a stereo fanatic, as you know. But that might be another really, really great solution for you. Note to self. Okay, I, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a video called Five Great Worship Rigs. And in this Five Great Worship Rigs video, I'm going to go through, if you will, the five food groups. So one of which is going to be some sort of direct out, one of which is going to be the sequestered amplifier, one of which is going to be the, um, you know, the... Um, the direct to front of house, the other of which is going to be using some sort of cab sim on the floor, and then the other one, I don't know, I'll make it up as I go along. But the point being is, is that there's got to be a fifth one. Oh, um, I don't know, I'll find a fifth one. Uh, great, oh, I love that. Um, I really wanted to go back to an app, I'm at an impasse. Um, Hello again, Deanne. Um, you know what? Again, th that that Rev D20, uh, I, I have a video that I put up on the Worship Musician channel. Uh, and then I did a, a, a series of videos for them on the Rev channel. Check that out. That might be just what you need. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like right in the middle of worship. I love that. There, you know, the funny thing is, is the, the, the glitch... Glitch ones aren't my thing. And there's every so often there's an effect I'm kind of going, and, and I'm going to curse myself for saying this, like, oh, I'd never use that. And that, that was kind of one of the ones I was just like, I'm never going to use that. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, yeah, you know, money is, is a thing. Uh, you know, it, it is it is a fascinating part of this process. And that's kind of one of the reasons why it's really important um, to not become part of the process of like, well, unless you spend X thousands of dollars, you know, you have the latest and greatest, you know, honestly, there's actually, it's, it's a funny thing. And I don't, I don't want to, I want to make sure that I'm not kind of like, I've talked about it enough, but I want to be clear that, that, well, I don't know. In, in the, in this new quad cortex video, one of the things I, t I talk about is setting up what I call the one preset gig rig effectively, but that's what the chapter is called, one preset gig. And the idea is using one amp model with a couple of different levels of gain and a couple of different effects and have it be enough to get you done. And then literally I'm using a five-way pickup selector on the Strat to go between five pretty markedly different sounds and styles. And the idea is back in the day, you kind of had one amp, one main guitar and a couple of pedals, and that was all you had to work with. So, you know, it's interesting, Brett, you know, you and I probably have a very similar history and like, well, that's how I learned to do what I do. And it's very strange taking the, the guitar, making waves in the room, and instead the guitar is coming out of the PA exclusively. It is a huge paradigm shift. Uh, and, you know, it, but it is, it's the shift that's happened. And sometimes we can't, uh, can't go back. Uh, what's going on, Brian? How you doing? Hello to you. Good to see you. I like that photo. That looks like a very happy photo. I like that a lot. You know, it's a funny thing when people put the shades on top of their head. It's usually just got a cool vibe. I like that a lot. So, oh, look at this. I, Alan, I'll give you a gold star. Uh, 
That's so funny. Uh, the, oh, look at this. Come on, guys. I think I remember you mentioning that, Brad. Uh, uh, wow. Come on. Uh, virtual uh, Holy Spirit uh, fist bump on that. You got to love that. God's just so good. Uh, oh, listen to this. When I was a kid, my dad would play guitar and worship the Lord deeply alone in his room. Now 30, I wish I would have taken, uh, taken, now 30, I wish he would have taken me into the Lord's presence as a kid. Um, he did. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, my dad's not alive anymore. Um, and I miss him a lot. It's a strange thing once your once your parents are gone. It's it's just kind of it happens. It's part of the process of life. My mom's ninety years old. Uh, I, you know, it, it's uh, there's this whole thing that starts to happen where they you know they slow down and all of a sudden you know you, you unless you're some place where there's a lot of retirement people at a certain point they don't really leave the home a lot. Uh, increasingly, they're going to be on some sort of a walker. And it's just this whole strange thing where you just don't see them anymore because they kind of like, they end up inside and then kind of this, this end process happens. My dad wasn't actually on a walker. Uh, he didn't live quite long enough for that part. Um, but it's just, you know, there is a, there is an inherent spiritually that we get from our parents, good, bad, in between. But, you know, the fact that like that memory is so clear to you you know, the thing is, is that I remember Mel, M Melissa, my wife, talking about uh, she would come in in the morning and, you know, her, her dad would, before work, she would wake up and, and he would have already had the Bible out on, on the kitchen table and, you know, before he went to work and his manager at this, at, at, at this place. And it was an experience that he had that was a very personal one for him, but the inspiration of seeing that devoutness and that relationship was very sticky. So, you know, I, I totally hear you. And I really appreciate your sharing that because that is um, um, intimate. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think your dad had a pretty good idea that you would by osmosis be picking up what was going on there. Uh, I think parents, are, and I'm sure you know that, but I just want to affirm that. That's really cool. Yeah, no, it's and and you know the funny thing is, Rick, there are periods of time that I put the guitar down and I come back and I'm and I do play differently. So I feel you. Father's jamming solos in the worship is another. Uh, hold on, father's jamming solos is one thing. Worship is as another. Take your kids into the presence. Uh, you know, it it it's uh, I, I I there's lots there. Um. No, that, that and that's and that you know it's interesting. I'm going to unpack part of that. You know, this is this is this is one of the things. It's it's funny. I was on tech support. Uh, it was either Kajabi or Kajabi. Uh, so it's this content management system for course curriculum that I um, th that I pay lots of money to. Uh, but the guy's name was was Isaac. I'm like, oh, your dad was kind of a famous guy. And he said, yeah, but he tried to kill me. <laughs> I said he didn't really finish the job. He said no, thankfully. So it was a it was a Bible joke. But sometimes you know um, the 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 sacrifice of of you know involved in these these relationships, and also the fact that that, that times change. It's it's an interesting dynamic that's happening there. You know um, the 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 thing I want to pull out of that is what 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 are we willing to go up the mountain? and take to the fire and just go, okay, if that's what you want from me, God. Um, and, you know, I'm, 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 I should be asking myself the same question. So I am, right? Um, and I can think of a few things. Uh, so, you know, sometimes, you know, out of that sacrifice comes the blessing, right? You know, it's, it's a funny thing, God. God works in such unexpected and abnormal ways. Uh, it's pretty cool. So, um, but yeah, you know, it's just like, I would say, unless it's Lincoln Brewster, it's not time to pull out the Ingve guitar solos. Uh, had to tend the doggy. That's the first dog break that I've known of on a live stream. <laughs> All right. Um, 
There we go. Uh, that's great. Learning to sing and play lead now. I love that. Uh, good, 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 good. Well, you know, this this is another thing. It's just like, you know, this is, it's an interesting thing as believers. It's like, we don't really want to kind of like, quote unquote, have, we don't want to put the people who we admire too much on a pedestal because hero worship can turn into, you know, uh, it can turn into something that's not intended to be. But, you know, the great thing is, is that um, the Joes and the Steves, you know, it is it is really good to to actually seek out people that we can be heroes without worshiping them is the part I was trying to say. Thanks for that, Rick. Um, and so the idea is is that, you know, Joe and Steve have been huge. In, in case you didn't know, I studied with Joe Satriani for three and a half years with us, but a wee tyke, a little 15-year-old Doug Doppler showing up at Joe Satriani for a guitar lesson. Uh, three and a half years of, of some really amazing mentorship and discipleship musically. And, you know, th through Joe, I met Steve when I was 18, you know, so, which was a long time ago. Um, so, you know, th those formative relationships are, are very powerful. So I will encourage you to find them in a couple of different ways. And I'm, I'm going to go KWS on you. Not Kenny Wayne Shepherd, but Kim Walker-Smith. Uh, I don't do the interviews with the magazine much anymore. Uh, if I'm totally honest, it's because I hate editing interviews. By the way, a couple of words of wisdom for the worship team, folks. This is an aside. If there's something that somebody else can do that you're doing, and they can do it nearly as well or better, or it just doesn't matter, get them to do it. Um, so that's one of the things about about the worship musician uh, crew is that our team is kind of starting to grow uh, and we're being much more conscious about some of the things we're doing in the guitar end of things especially. And, you know, God really just kind of had a conversation with me earlier today about just like, do a better job of leading that team as a team. So just so you know, um, as the editorial director, which sounds more important than it is, um, I really have taken everything that I've learned about church leadership and brought it into the framework of how we do whatever the things I have the opportunity to lead around the magazine. So I lead it like it's kind of like it's a worship team and the team side of what we do and the, the doing it like it's a church means that we, we have a chance to really have this opportunity to bring those, those sorts of best practices. The idea is you're always looking for somebody that you can raise up. You're always looking for how you can replicate. You're always looking for, all the things that you want to do, looking at, you know, am I doing a good job in my role? And if you, you know, the, the, it's a healthy environment. Uh, and so, you know, it was interesting, you know, God was really like, you need to lead that more like a team and less like a bunch of writers. So we have recently started having these meetings where we kind of talk about what it is that we're going to do. But a team leader versus, you know, leading a team in a meeting setting, it's a different thing. So God really just kind of called me out on that. So the point being is that, that, having heroes gives us people that we can look up to for inspiration. Nigel, for one, I actually had a chance to watch Nigel lead a team meeting at Hillsong. There's way more to that guy than Gretsch and uh, some, some great sounds and amazing playing. And to watch him in a leadership role, I was just like, uh, God had me there for a reason. It was, it was really, it was an awesome moment. And again, just watching how he led watching his words, the way he spoke to people, the care he had for the people in, in his care. I was like, oh, it was a thing. Uh, yep. So, you know, all right, so uh, my own voice. So that gets us back to kind of, you know, the, the fuel for what, what happened here at the second hour. I love the fact that everybody's here. Um, thank you, by the way. Um. You know, the idea, when I, again, notice, I'm like, wow, there's a bunch of people that are coming from, from Tuesday to Saturday. They're they're looking for something. So, I, you know, kind of like an, the obvious thing would be go, what are you looking for? Um, which would be great. Like, what are you looking for? Uh, please let me know. 
and and feel free to be as specific as is possible if I don't get to all the chat tonight uh, because I got to eat. Um, but the thing is, after I whine about sacrifice, I'm like, yeah, I got to eat. I got to get this short after. In any case, uh, the idea is that tonight was about helping you guys find that thing that's a little bit eluding you in the creative thing. I've been so blessed with the opportunity to ruminate and live in the creative space. I understand how therapeutic that is for, for my soul. I understand that once you make the conscious choice to be living your creative self through the creative lens as opposed to letting work creep into that, I was just like, it was just, it was a mind-blowing perspective. And as you spend more time in the creative space, you just begin to see things through that lens and that becomes your perspective. But the other part of it is, is that there's some practical stuff that I really want to make sure that I have the opportunity because of the experience and the perspective I've got of where I'm at right now to be able to share that. Just And really, as I was kind of going into this, it's like, I want to be concise tonight, uh, which at the first part, I did a really, I think, a good job. Again, you got to celebrate the victories. Um, but the idea is, is like being very clear about, you know, this is taking what I've learned in this season and sharing it with you such that it's about the things that I've learned. It's not what I've done. And so the Larry Mitchells and the Gems, the inspiration I'm getting from them, it means that that kind of passes through me. This is one of the reasons it's so important to be raising people up. It's not that it just gets deposited in who they are. It passes through them and gets deposited into the people that they raise up. And it's just such an important part of the process. Oh, did I see Dan Huff? Oh, there we go. Hold on a second. I, I, I missed one here. Uh, 80 stuff. There we go. I love it. That's great. Come on. All right. Uh, wow. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I'm not bringing that one to defeat. All right. There we go. Uh, Alan, the PV guy, I love that. I've got, I've got to reach out to who do I? I think I know the PR person, PV. All right, I, I, on my list. All right, compressor drives mods. Uh, okay, good, good, good. Uh, for an ISO box, tried all the new modeling processes and was and was disappointed and successful. I will look into the rev amp. I'm in Northeast Ohio. Um, yes, and and you know here here's the thing is is like I think I've got to I've got to figure out. I've got a couple of things in in the cooker hopper, uh, but that five warship rigs video kind of needs to be made because I think it is um, it'll give people an idea. It's like and specifically saying, look, if you don't have the ability to have any sound on the platform, but you want to have an amp amp vibe, the, the uh, I'll rabbit trail very briefly on the rev amp. Give me a moment. I'm grabbing the rev amp. Why talk about what you can show? There we go. First of all, they're about as cute as you could ever get. They're available in black and white. And basically on the back of this puppy, you've got all the goodness that you could want to have. There's your, uh, somewhere, one of these here is the effects loop. There's your direct out. Uh, there is, sorry, it's totally backwards. So there's your MIDI. Um, and then uh, on the front, you basically have all this goodness. One of these here is where you can run it. Hey, I'm going to lose you. Sorry there, bud. But there we go. Uh, you, one of these is the, gosh, upside down. Uh, one of these is the ability to run it at 4 or 20 watts. The other is to set the, uh, the direct out such that it's either uh, pre-power amp tubes or post-power amp tubes. And the thing is that this guy right here, Five of them? Six of them. Six on board, basically, settings for uh, the IRs and whatnot. And it's got, uh, basically, a selectable drive control. Uh, and it just, it's a great amp. And so, basically, it's it's got a, it's got two six, uh, six V6s, which are the power tubes. And, you know, when you think about a preamp section and a power amp section, you think about preamp tubes 
mattering, which they do, but the power amp tubes have a huge impact on the sound of the tone, as you guys will know. So the 6V6s have got, got this very gentle thing. They're, it's actually one of the things I love about 6V6s. 6L6s are a little bit pokier, where 6V6s have this lovely compression. What people love about deluxe reverbs is what people love about vibroverbs. They just have this very, they're just pretty. Um, and so the, the ability to bring that in, uh, and then with the uh, Two Notes Torpedo remote, you're then able to use uh, the, their, that software, and that includes amp models, I should say cabinet models, as well as power amp section models. And I don't remember if you can bring the power amp section models back over to the amp. You actually have to have the computer connected to do that. So I need to, to go back and refresh my memory on that. But the point being is, is that a huge palette of tones available. Uh, and honestly, you know, if you had to bring that on a laptop, the world's not going to end. But just great sounds. And what's neat is like you, you, you have your choice of going pre or post power amp, which means if you're missing hearing the sound of the power amp, you're getting that going front of house. So you actually have that whole amp experience bundled in the midst of all of that. And for that matter, you could use the you know the four cable method uh, with the uh, the GT one hundred, and you know then you're not having to sell that or whatever in in the in the midst of that. Um, hopefully, uh, yes, the Julia have one on my board uh, on my regular board, but the Fractal ones are, are great. I'm a little I'm a little behind your live feed. Me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Fractal stuff. That you know, honestly, you know, if, if somebody was going to say. I'm just going to go there. Who's got the best sounding effects of all? Uh, Billy Holladale? I'm, I mispronounced his last name. I could have Googled it. Howardell. Uh, but he's in, I think, a perfect circle. He was at one of the camps that I teach at. And he had, uh, he's, a, he's a fractal guy. And he had this sound that was, I think it was, it was a tape echo or a analog delay but whatever it was it was one of the sounds in his fractal and it did this thing where as the repeats like i was it was the antithesis of what i did with the rush thing where it just kind of and he's he went and finished this thing and the repeats just kind of went like this and it was this perfect arc and i wouldn't say it was necessary linear i think part of what made it cool is it kind of went like this but it just had this perfect thing as it disappeared off into the ether. Each delay got the right amount quieter, but it didn't degrade. It was already this perfect degraded sound. It was, I was just like, it was one of those moments. I'm like, oh, it was like, you know, again, because when you go and the, the, the way that the, the delay trails off is part of the, the, you know, first of all, it's happening while you're actively playing. It also happens, obviously, when you do like a slide or finish something. But it was a moment like I, I, I've only had one other moment, which I'll share because I always share the two stories together. I was in the studio with John Cunaberti, who's co-produced and engineered a bunch of the Satriani records. And it was right around the time that Pro Tools HD started becoming the thing, which is 20 years ago now. But Jeff Campitelli was was playing on one of these Satriani records, uh, drummer, and uh, he played me something, and it was the cymbal going, Shh, and disappearing into nothingness. So those of you who are as old as I am know that usually when a cymbal disappears into nothingness, at some point it disappears into nothingness and you hear, some sort of noise because usually something somewhere is hissing and making some, but it just disappeared. You're hearing the symbol get off into the distance and then silence. I was like, it, it's just, you know, it's kind of like um, hearing the phone ring in uh, the matrix. The first time, you know, you, you read a, I'm just going to go to read a DVD and you, and, and you put it in your DVD player and you hear the phone on the matrix. You're like, it sounds like the phone's in the room. Like for those of us who go back to the VHS days, like it, the audio wasn't like that. I digress. Uh, 
Uh, you guys are peeing out. I love it. What's going on, Captain Scarlet? I love that he calls me the Gear Whisperer. I could never get away with doing that. But that was one of my that is one of my, my most favorite affectionate terms. And I've been called a few things in my lifetime. That's one of one of my most favorite things I've ever been called. I love it. You guys are having too much fun. All right. Uh, good, 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 good. What's going on, Keith? With great pleasure. And now it's yours to share. And I'm not meaning like now you need to share it. I'm just saying now it's yours. Because the great thing about it is is like I've had a lot of people that have poured into me, and it's my privilege and pleasure, and most importantly, privilege to be able to share it. So I hope, I hope in some way it inspires and and does something awesome. And thank you for saying so, much appreciated. Okay, uh, okay, good, 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 good. Uh, there we go. I, I'll take that. Oh my word. Oh, cockles of the heart warming again. Uh, overflow. So thank you. Let me receive that in the spirit it was, with which it was set. So thank you very much. Really. Um, and I'm going to do my best to up the bar. So that's all I got to say. I've, I, I just want to step into a zone of doing it better and better and better and better. Not for the sake of bettering, but for the sake of like, let, let's, let, let me actually put the TLC into it. I need to. So thank you. Much appreciated. Um, uh, and so, you know, th this is the thing is, is that I, I'm, and I'm going to finish up with this and then I'm going to go, I'm going to go grab a bite. So first of all, thank you to everybody that's been here. Um, when I was at GIT, Steve, uh, came into the seminar, Vi, that is. And one of the things he, he said in passing, but it was one of those like giant mic drop moments for me. He said, you know, I don't practice for my best day. I practice for my worst day. And I was like, Ooh. That was powerful. So yeah, and you know the, the the thing is is that Steve is is uh it is just such an inspiration. All right, there's a couple more pouring in here. Fine, I lied. Oops. Um. Oh my word! <laughs> Going old school. Speaking of DVDs, uh, thank you, T. What's up? Uh. So uh, that is a great question. So let's see. I, I wonder if I can find my notes from today. So you just kind of made me go there. So there we go. Let's see if I can find that. No, wait, why isn't this in here? All right, hang on a second. Hang on a second. It'll be here. There we go. Team Doppler is going to be creating a wide array of captures, profiles, IRs, and lesson content to maximize your guitar experience. I'd love to become part of your guitar journey and cordially invite you to become part of this community of guitar and gear fanatics. <laughs> that's just slowly an honor about as thick as I possibly could. So that's basically what I'm putting uh, on this email signup form uh, for, that's on kind of in the body of the quad cortex video. So um, yes, thank you. First of all, thank you so much. That DVD... Um, is one of the most definitive things that I've ever done. It was extremely important to me. Uh, it has been the the PDF from that DVD I teach out of and share at the guitar camps that I teach at. Uh, it in many ways is just the distillation of the things that Joe taught me and at that point, 20 years of teaching guitar. Uh, so thank you. Yes, hugely important to me. Um, so yes, I am actively working on what is going to be something we can just right now call it modal madness, uh, but that's not actually going to be the working title. I'm trying to find something that's fun, but not stupid. Uh, and, and there's lots of things that I think are fun that my wife is like, it's kind of stupid uh, in a non-dismissive way. And I'm, I'm most of the time have the common sense to listen to her uh, versus kind of really textbook, like modal mastery. You know, it's just like, it's so not, I mean, I want it to be mastery, but I also want it to be, you know, um, modes and music or something like that, or, you know, modes, comma, musically, or something such that the goal is, is that it, it is about taking the experience of understanding the instrument and doing it in a way that is informative, inspirational, but is, a, is also highly musical. And the thing about diatonic theory and harmony, although the DVD is not the best platform for doing it, one disc was the progressions that were intended to go along with the other disc, which was the teaching. Because the idea is if you can't apply it towards making music, then it's a little extraneous. But one of the other things that I've been doing a lot lately um, 
is really focusing on how people learn. Uh, and the short version of that is, is that when you learn, you know, and poor Chris Alexander, he's like, he was like, yeah, I've been hearing about this for weeks. Uh, but the, the short version is, is that the guitar pathway to learning is usually, especially at the very beginning of the process, somebody put something in our, in our hands and showed us to go. And as I said to numerous people on the course of my teaching on Saturday, nobody would have said that, by the way, is contrapuntal motion. And we wouldn't have had any idea that that was a, an A, C, E, A, A, G sharp, C, E, and an A, or sorry, a G sharp, C, E, and a B, and a G, uh, C, E, and uh, uh, another C, you know, and that this was a D major in first inversion, and that that was an F major seven, whose notes are F, A, C, E. I'm like, I wouldn't have known any of that. And the pathway in, as we're learning to grow on the instrument, was pretty much void of all that, kind of like, this is what it is. It was also void of the systems of being able to kind of go, well, let's analyze this and see what's going on there. Nothing wrong with that, however, because that is the essence of how we play guitar. Uh, but the problem is most people who play a C chord actually don't know that it's C, E, G, C, E, one, three, five, one, three. Which means like, wow, if I wanted to take that C major and turn it into a C minor, what would I have to do? If I wanted to turn it into a C major seven, I don't know what I would need to change or what scale degree numbers, or what are the note names? Like they're just kind of like, if you play just by the shapes, yes, you can hear stuff, but the ability to then have a quote unquote intelligent conversation with somebody like a keyboardist, excuse me, it becomes very, very limited. So the goal is, is we're coming over to the keyboard. We're taking that information off the keyboard and that classically based relationship, bringing it over to some stuff that we're actually going to write out. And the reason being is, is that it means we will have taken it from the source of how we really look at Western music, and it is based on the piano. We're going to take some of that stuff but not all of it. For example, all right, I'll go there. Um, key signatures, are they important? Do they matter? Yes, they're important. Yes, they matter. How important are they and how much do they matter to guitar players? And when, why, when, and where do key signatures actually matter? I am 99% positive, not 100, the key signatures are really the cliff notes for keyboarders just saying, these are the black keys you have to hit in this key. They're all kind of, I mean, if you think about it, the key signatures, they don't kind of go up in an even order. I mean, it's a little strange little mishmash. They're all kind of hopped over here like, you know, the focus fox. You know, that is to say, they're not kind of, you know, just going up diatonically. So it's a little strange how they did it, but they did it so they could kind of get them to sit side by side. I get that, sort of. But the point being, is my belief is, is that the key signatures are cliff notes for, for keyboarders, literally telling them, because when we play an A major scale, and we play a B major scale, and we play a C major scale, guess what? The fingering never changes, but on piano, if you don't know which keys have black keys in between in, in them, you can't actually play them. So I really believe it's the cliff notes for telling, it's, it's basically tablature for piano players. Um, but that's kind of my take on it. So some of that stuff, we don't actually really need to know the key signatures per, per se. We need to know that the, the, the key of E major is E, hold the F sharp, hold the G sharp, have to A, hold the B, hold the C sharp, hold the D sharp, have to E. We know to, need to know that the key of A is A, hold the B, hold the C sharp, have to D, hold the E, hold the F sharp, hold the G sharp, have to A. We need to know the key of D is D, hold the E, hold the F sharp, have to G, hold the A, hold the B, hold the C sharp, have to D. G, hold the A, hold the B, have to C, hold the D, hold the E, hold the F sharp, have to G. B, hold the C sharp, hold the D sharp, have to E, hold the F sharp, hold the G sharp, hold the A sharp, have to B. And then that gets it back to the high E string. That is to say, that's really just taking the two holes and a half, three holes and a half from the white keys and the black keys and, and the piano and just going, two holes and a half, three holes and a half, which outworks itself to be E, hold the F sharp, hold the G sharp, so on and so forth. So the idea is we're taking that information from the piano, but there's a middle step that I missed for many years, including the other step that I missed was the value 
of knowing the note names. And I, I've, I've known the note names pretty well, but I placed a lot more value on the scale degree numbers than the note names. That's changed because the scale degree numbers, if I know this is one hold to two, hold to three, half to four, hold to five, hold to six, hold to seven, half to one, I could literally, I'm going to blow your minds here for a second, but what the hey. I'm going to play the key of E, A, D, G, and B major simultaneously. That might not sound good, but literally I'm playing the one, hold the two, hold the three, half to four, hold the five, hold the six, hold the seven, half to one of E, A, D, G, and B. Which means that like, wow, if you look at the guitar neck like that, you're like, wow. And the whole point is if you know the key of E major, A major, D major, G major, and B major, you're cruising along pretty well where your average guitar player doesn't know keys really at all. But the thing is, is that information is an extrapolation of kind of what started over on the keyboard. But that middle step of actually just going, all right, let's write out, you know, one, hold the two, hold the three, half to four, hold the five, hold the six, hold the seven, half to one. Now let's write that starting at E. E, hold the F sharp, hold the G sharp, half to A, hold the B, hold the C sharp, hold the D sharp, half to E. Then we go, all right, one, hold the two, hold the three, half to four, hold the five, hold the six, seven, half to one. Uh, e, I, e, hold the F sharp, hold the G sharp, half to A, hold the B, hold the C sharp, hold the D sharp, half to E. Now we start on the keyboard, brought it over to that thing where we wrote it down on the imaginary piece of paper there, and then we placed it on the guitar. That process and where we, most people who play this would actually be incapable of going G, 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 F, D, F, G, F, D, G, F, D, G, G, B flat, G, B flat, G, B flat, G, G, uh, B flat, G, right? I mean, you know, like, I, 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 that was not necessarily the perfect example of it, but the idea of, of that for most guitar players is just like, they wouldn't know where to start. Oh, I gotta write that down. They wouldn't know where to start. Uh... I'm, and I, this is me, the digital pack rut. But here's the reason. Because that's not where they started on the instrument. Of course, they don't know where to start. It's not where they started. We're going to be training people on how to start over here, bring it to here, and bring it to here. In no way negating that Freebird experience or the... I learned that. 40 years ago. The point being is, is that experience of knowing what fret. Whatever it is, that part I, oh well. The point being is, is that guitar playing driven experience part of it, it's great. Invaluable is what makes guitar playing amazing. But the other part is to be able to go, well, that's great. I've played like, you know, 2112 for 40 years. And that's all I know how to play. And I don't know how to think outside of, I just learned it from the shapes that whatever those frets are. Again, like I wrote down for myself, uh, they wouldn't know where to start because they don't know where to start. Because the starting place is basically I play this at this fret. It doesn't really lead you any place other than just kind of following that through and playing some of those same ideas because you don't know where the other notes are. That doesn't mean that you won't find other stuff, but that it's just a path that is a finite path and arguably it's the number one reason why guitar players are frustrated because they just kind of come back to the same rutted path. I promise you if you, you know, if you put a um That's basically a one, five, one, nine, and a five. So you could play major, Dorian, Lydian, mixed Lydian, and minor over the top of that. So if you have that just droning,
you're going to, by knowing the note names and the formulas of the modes, I should say we started with the formulas and the note names, you're going to actually be able to move up and down that low E string and have a pathway to a giant amount of, first of all, improvisation, which is a huge part. I don't want to just show people kind of like, here are the notes, go away, thank you. I want to actually give people the, the framework in which they can understand what's going on at a very clear level from the piano to this thing. I own this information. Now I'm pasting that onto the guitar, which means I had to know it before I put it on the guitar. Again, they wouldn't know where to start. You're going to know where to start. Thank you very much. So it's taking what I've already done and then just kind of going, okay, let's 10 exit. Let's 100 exit. Let's 1,000 exit. But the idea is all how much I've grown. And honestly, people have heard me say this before. I kind of went into one of these guitar camps. It was a, a John Petrucci camp. I have the privilege of teaching at Joe Satriani, Steve Vines, and John Petrucci's camp. How does that happen? Right? You know, just because you get to do it doesn't mean you don't, you kind of every so often kind of go, really? Me? How? So the point being is, is that I was kind of just teaching the same shtick over and over, and I just went, I'm disgusted with myself. Uh, I'm just like, I'm just teaching the same. And as a guitar player, I watched this thing that Tom Quayle did, and he's improvising all the way up and down the neck. And I, you know, what Joe taught me to do was the first finger is where, is where the transitions happen. I was watching Tom Quayle move, and he moves from either side. And I was like, I can't do that, and I need to do that, and I want to do that. But, and what I ultimately came down was the pinky being able to hear whether the next note was a half step or a whole step apart and intuitively kind of know intuitively how far you need to move. That can just a matter of like, all right, well, I guess that just means we're going to go. Sorry. That is, I'm purposely sliding it on the first finger, which is totally intuitive for me. And I'm sliding with the pinky. Now, you're going to notice one other thing. is like, I wasn't looking. Now, it's not like I'm some fancy pants guitar player. Part of what I'm learning to do is just like, I don't have to look at the notes. Or... Not only that, once I actually know what the notes are, that's, that's B, C, D, E, F sharp, and G. If I can hit it, G, F sharp, E, D, C, B, A, G, F sharp, E, D, C, B, A, G, G, F sharp, E, D, C, B, A, G, F sharp, E. And every so often I may have to look down, but the point being is I actually, that's a G, F sharp, E, D, C. It's just because I went E, hold the F sharp, half the G, hold the A, hold the B, have to C, hold the D, hold the E. E, hold the D, hold the C, have to B, hold the A, hold the G, hold the F sharp, have to E. And you can literally hear, if you can hear it here, then. So, yeah. So this next one, it's going to be really cool. Not because I think it's cool, because every week I get a chance to watch how it transforms the way that guitar players like I started playing, you know? Like Free Bird, like I remember, I can feel the feeling of being at my buddy's house. It actually was, kind of lived across the way here from me, down up, up the hill across the way. Uh, and I just remember the feeling of being in his in his house and the room and learning those things, you know, when music was just an electric guitar and all these bands, I was hearing that stuff for the first time. I love that part of the experience. I would never trade that. But the idea of being able to augment that with this other kind of uh, um, deeper knowledge, I, I, I'll actually say it, but hopefully in a way that's not offensive and, and is clear, omniscient. Well, you just kind of look at it and you just know, right? There's there's a sense of knowing. Um, that's different than kind of like, I'm playing Freebird, but I don't know anything other than, you know, kind of lining up the patterns of the pentatonic, which I can barely do because I know it's at the sixth fret, but what happens when I'm in this key and all of a sudden everything's in the wrong location? Oh, no, I'm just going to stay in this key. That internal conversation, like, ah, I'm just going to stay here. And, you know, 40 years later, I'm like, I've been staying here for 40 years. I think I'm bored. Uh, the idea is, is that guitar players, you know, it's, it's kind of, Brad kind of summed it up. It's like, they're hungry. 
So, you know, it's not like that hungry doesn't mean dumb. That just means they're hungry. They haven't had anybody show them because, again, what happens is, again, to quote, they wouldn't know where to start because nobody really showed us at the beginning. It's like, hey, you know, it's really cool. This Freebird thing, you want to learn to feel it. And it's just like that's that's the vibe of the guitar. But at some point, the notes are going to be valuable in the, and what they represent in the scale. So just keep that in mind. If somebody said that to me back then, I would have been like, I either wouldn't have believed them and I would have believed, but I was like, huh. So in any case, all right, I digress. Uh, there were a couple more comments that came in that I will do my best to get to the end of the comment list there before I go eat some dinner. Um, all right, uh, so thank you, T. Moody. Much, much appreciated. Uh, if you had only one choice, a Telecaster or Les Paul, boy, you're going to be tough. You're a tough guy. Um, well, the funny thing is I have a Telecaster and a Les Paul, both of which are... The actually the funny thing is, is behind me, if you look right there, I, technically it's a broadcaster, and that's the Les Paul. Those are two of my favorite guitars. So it's kind of like, well, which child do I love more? Uh, but I would have to say because of how long she's been with me, Paula would be the one that I would have to have to choose. Uh, you know, so like if they were like... Yeah, I'm not even going to make the analogy, but the point is, if I had to choose one or the other, not necessarily to play, but like, I'm kind of like, okay, I can only take one with me. You know, maybe it's, I I, I, I gave, I've gave a guitar to a friend basically the other day. I, I, and and I, I don't give gear away. It's not really kind of my vibe. I, I, I tend to be more on the receiving side of that transaction, uh, if I'm going to be really honest. Uh, but I sent them a, a, a guitar, and, and the funny thing is I sent I, the funniest thing in the email, but I really felt moved to do it. I just said, look, the guitar stays mine, but if I die and you still got the guitar, per this email, you get to keep it. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the thing is, is, it was just a funny thing. But as you get a little bit older, you begin to think about, you know, maybe there's there's le the glass is a little bit more empty than it is full. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's so funny. That's good. I love that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Doug's disciples. Oh my word. Oh, you guys are funny. We need shirts, picks and straps. Uh, there we go. All right, you guys. Um, thank you so much. All right. On that note, it's time to close out with a little bit of prayer. Thanks so much, go guys. Uh, thank you. Yep, Joe's eyes were closed for sixty percent. His hands were all, uh, were doing all uh, all by themselves. Yep. All right, Lord. What a great night! Celebrate that again. Celebrate the victories, and Lord, I just pray that hopefully uh, tonight uh, the message that I believe that was your message to bring, and I just got a chance to hopefully carry that a little bit down the field here, uh, falls on on fertile ears, and more importantly, productive minds and and this is inspiring and is um is timely and is um encouraging uh for those that need need just a a little spritzing and for those that need a lot of spritzing hopefully you know the idea is like hey you know what just because it's been this way doesn't mean that it needs to stay that way so i i love having the privilege and the opportunity to pour into other people it's such a gift lord and i i thank you for it and i treasure it and it is so uh, it's so life-giving, and I give thanks for, for this community. I give thanks for the people in the community and their uniqueness, celebrating the uniqueness, and just thank you so much. And just I, I look forward to this, and what a, what a gift and a joy. So, Lord, we just thank, thank you for gifting and joy and the gifts of joy and the joy of giving. So we said all of that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Oh, what a privilege. All right, you guys, have a great and gals. Uh, but if I say guys, you know what I mean, guys and gals. Have a great night. God bless. And I will see you next Tuesday. And some of you, I'll see you on Saturday. Thanks so much. God bless. Bye-bye.